My name is Varin Sachide, very honored to be your MC for this afternoon. The Sustainability for Business Forum, or SBF, is organized by the Franco Thai Chamber of Commerce, the Netherlands Thai Chamber of Commerce, and the Swedish Thai Chamber of Commerce, with its official partners, namely the Belu Thai Chamber of Commerce, the Danish Thai Chamber of Commerce, the Norwegian Thai Chamber of Commerce, and the Thai Finnish Chamber of Commerce. The forum today will be quite successful, and it will not be possible uh, without the uh, support of our strategic partner, namely USAID, Green Invest Asia, our sponsors, namely Petra Pak, L'Oreal, Venturi Turnkey Factory, our supporters, namely Faber Flags Asia, Sentinel Solution Thailand, Skypoint Hospitality and Technology, and Symbior Solar. Our booster, namely Polytech the Environmental and Energy Solutions Show to be held in Lyon, France in October 2021. And you're invited to discover more about each of our sponsors and supporters at their booth in the foyer during the uh, coffee break. They all provide the incredible solutions for sustainability. And not to mention the beautiful venue here, our hotel partner, Bangkok Marriott Marquis Queens Park, who received the uh, SEAL Thailand MICE venue standards as well as MICE Sustainability Appreciation Certificate granted by the uh, Thailand Convention and Exhibition Bureau, or TSEP, last year. So you can be rest assured of the environmentally, economically, and socially responsible concept and practice of this beautiful venue. Last but not least, I have to thank our advisors, Phytros Asia, hereby represented by Mr. Henri de Rebeau, and Green Building Consulting and Engineering, led by Ms. Agnel Lebion, who put all the energy for the success of the SBF throughout the years, year after year. So ladies and gentlemen, please give all of them a big round of, uh, of uh, applause <laughs> for our contributors of the SBF 20. And now to officially open the SBF 20, I'd like to invite on the stage His Excellency Mr. K. Srada, the Ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to Thailand for the opening remarks. Ambassador. Savary Kaap, good afternoon. Well, warm welcome to all of you in this very spaced out attendance. Um, and thank you to the organizing for having me again. Uh, I just was reminded that uh, I spoke last year as well, but actually I also attended the one before I just arrived in Thailand. So it's already my third time that I'm at this very inspiring event and it's an honor for me to be able to say a few words at the opening. Um, and I must congratulate the, the bilateral chambers of commerce for this organization and it's very good to see that Oh, well, it has changed, but if you look at uh, the space for the co-organizers, it's growing every year, and that's the right way to go, and we hope that soon we might even expand it further, so that's, uh, I think that's very good news. And uh, why is that good news? Because I think the issue uh, on the agenda of your uh, discussions today, uh, sustainability, is of course absolutely fundamental. Um, so every event that strengthens our awareness of the need to do something about sustainability and so on is very welcome. But I think this meeting especially is very welcome because we don't only talk about it, but I think it's very much focusing on concrete solutions. And I think that's what makes this, this forum a bit different from a few others, is that you're also not just talking about, but also showing what can be done to do something about sustainability. So I think that's very important. Um, so why is it so important that we put sustainability in the center of our decision making as governments, as private sector, as individuals as well for that matter? Well, first of all, because of course our pattern of consuming and producing, producing is not sustainable. And the easy way to, to show that is of course the earth overshoot day that you might be familiar with, which is the day in a given year that we start consuming more than what, what the planet can regenerate in that same year. So we start, we eat up the planet. This year, uh, Earth Overshoot Day was uh, the 20th of August. The good news is that it's a few weeks later than last year, obvious reason being that because of the COVID pandemic and the crisis, there was less consumption. But the bad news is that on the 21st of August, we still started behaving in a non-sustainable way. So I think this shows clearly that we have to do something about our, uh, 
our, our ways of uh, consuming, producing. And then, of course, the other issue with sustainability is climate. As you know, our uh, politicians, our heads of state and government signed the Paris Agreement five years ago. Um, and they did that, of course, because they wanted to limit the global warming by two degrees, preferably one and a half. Uh, I was sitting this morning next to the Minister of Energy, and he showed me on his telephone, he had an app which shows the global warming that already took place, and it's a very, very sp scientific thing. And we are already at 0 0.94 degrees higher than the, 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 the start date. So from the one and a half, two degrees we have, we already have used one degree. So really it is a, it's a very urgent moment to do something about that. And uh, to be honest, again, looking at Paris five years later, the, the, the picture is not very rosy. On the one hand, we can see that most governments, to be honest, have not fulfilled what they signed for in 2015 in Paris, the uh, national determined contributions. And secondly, the climate change is going much faster than we thought five years ago. So on the one hand, we are not doing enough, and on the other hand, we should do more. And this will be the agenda of the next COP meeting in Glasgow in a, a year's time, where we will all meet again, and we will do what we said we would do five years ago, which is reassess the situation and see if we shouldn't be more ambitious. Yes, everything tells us we should be more ambitious, but uh, the chances of us becoming, being more, well, we'll see what the, poli what the political reality will tell us. Uh, but again, it's really very necessary to do something. Okay, enough of gloomy picture, let's look at positive side of things. And there are a few positive developments as well. I think if you look at the European Union, uh, the Netherlands within the European Union, I think the, the awareness, and you've perhaps read about the European Parliament yesterday, I think in Europe, by and large, the awareness is there that we have to be more ambitious, and we also want to try to convince the rest of the world community to be more ambitious. So I think that's very, very useful, very positive. And if you look at the Netherlands, this is not an easy decision. For example, we have uh, opened a few coal-fired power plants just a couple of years ago, and they're the most modern of Europe and the most efficient, but still, we might close them down within one or two years because otherwise we will never be able to reach our CO2 emission uh, reduction. And again, this will be cost us billions of euros because, of course, they were built by companies that had a guarantee of being able to sell it to the consumer. Well, so we will have to, uh, to, to pay damages. And again, this is very, very important. So I think Europe, in general, is quite a positive uh, change compared to five years ago. Another one is China. And China made this relatively surprising announcement at the General Assembly of the UN. President Xi Jinping said that China will be uh, carbon neutral in 2060. Sounds far away. Of course it is. It's 10 years after the EU wants to be carbon neutral. But still, it is... Um, uh, first time that China is mentioning, uh, mentioning a specific date. And since they are, of course, so important in terms of emissions, I think this is very good news. But uh, that's for governments. But also, I think, if you look at the private sector, at what your sector, uh, also there you see a lot of interesting initiatives. Uh, just to mention three or four. IKEA is going to stop uh, selling non-rechargeable -re batteries. Shell and Microsoft are joining forces to make sure that by 2050, Microsoft will be 100% carbon neutral, thanks to 100% renewable energy that they will receive from Shell. Unilever and Google are teaming up to get a much better insight in what's happening with our forests, our biodiversity, our water reserves, by using uh, cloud computing and AI. So these two giants are also working together. And last example is that our own king, Willem-Alexander, opened a factory recently in Delft Cell in the Netherlands. It's the first plant in the world that will recycle contaminated metals and will produce uh, purified metal blocks. So again, there are things happening. Uh, at a very much more modest level, as an embassy, we try to bring our little contribution with solar panels, a plug-in hybrid, uh, we hosted the Care for Plastic initiative of a few chambers of commerce uh, where hotels and hospitals will uh, collect uh, plastic to be recycled. So that was another interesting initiative. And last example is that we hosted an event on the 7th of August with Minister Varavut of Natural Resources and Envi Environment about the need for a green recovery. 
building back better. So hopefully that also in Thailand it will take off. Anyway, I could go on for much longer with very specific examples. I would like to leave it at that. And I think the exciting part today is that at the end of today, I would be able to add, I'm sure, quite a lot of other examples of sustainable behavior by private sector actors, because reading the agenda, uh, cities, food, fashion, uh, consume, consuming patterns, and so on, and uh, looking at the speakers, I'm sure we will hear a lot of exciting examples and inspiring examples. I would have to leave it at that. I'm on the strict instructions in terms of my time. Uh, but uh, again, I'm, uh, it's very good to see that there are so many people present, and I really wish you a very inspiring afternoon. And um, well, who knows, see you next year. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and Master Case Rudder from the Embassy of the Netherlands. Next, we also have uh, with us His Excellency Mr. Jan Astrom Grandal, Ambassador Designate of Sweden to Thailand, for the opening speech. Ambassador. so much uh, also for pronouncing my my name correctly you're the first one I think it's a very Swedish name <laughs> with many dots and things uh, <laughs> so distinguished guests uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, first of all let me thank the organizers for for having me uh, it's truly an truly a very important event uh, let me also thank my my dear colleague uh, his Ex excellency the Dutch ambassador for uh, uh, an inspiring uh, opening remark, but also eye-opening remarks, I have to say. And I got very inspired by what, what you are doing at your embassy and, and solar panels and, 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 and other things. And I accept that as a challenge. Um, um, I'm honored to be here um, today to participate at the opening of the Sustainability for Business Forum 2020. Uh, the Chambers of Commerce play an increasingly important role in contributing in sustainable business solutions. Uh, and I'm glad to notice among us here today many representatives uh, of businesses that are at the forefront um, of our inevitable transition, I would like to say, to a green and circular economy. Uh, Sweden and Thailand uh, recently celebrated 150 years of strong and excellent bilateral relations. Central already at the outset of our relationship was substantial trade in goods, traveling in both directions. Trade is still a cornerstone uh, between our countries, with Thailand being a major partner in that respect. But our countries have also become much more integrated uh, at all levels with massively expanded people-to-people -people contacts. We truly have a sh shared common future. Promoting sustainability uh, in all its forms and seeking new collaboration is a key part of my mission and my mandate. I've been here only for three weeks, so it's uh, still early days, uh, but it's very clear uh, that, that this, is, this is going to be a central part of, of my mission. Uh, not only because it is central to Swedish foreign policy and also in line with the, the, um, the international goals. Uh, but also, and honestly, it's because it's the right thing to do. Um, and ultimately, it is about which side of history we want to be on. Uh, our future generations now depend on us collectively. Uh, in succeeding. Global warming is a fact, can't be denied. Um, the ongoing pandemic has only distracted us for a while, even if the drastic reduction in emissions have shown us what is possible. If anything, the pandemic has shown us the opportunities in green investments. At the same time, the pandemic uh, has also resulted in a sudden surge uh, in the volume of plastic, waste, from personal protective equipment and single-use items. Um, recyclers in this region are faced with significant drops in both demand and sales prices for recycled plastics. And the volume of plastic collected and sorted by the informal sector has dropped by an estimated 65%. Uh, 
innovation and new opportunities within sustainable business are essential to tackling not only climate change, but to safeguard our biodiversity, essential for our survival, and to improve the standard of living for everyone. Sometimes you still hear about possible conflicts of interest between sustainability and growth. Nothing could be more wrong. Uh, nothing makes me more irritated. Uh, and please, please refer any still existing non-believer to the example of Sweden, where we have managed to grow our economy substantially, while at the same time being able to reduce carbon emissions and pollution. Two key instruments have been the energy and carbon dioxide taxes, and other examples are procurement of innovative technologies, well-developed public transport systems, recycling schemes, and provision of investment grants. The government has recently announced green recovery initiatives with much-needed public sector investments in green transition. EU-wide policy instruments, such as emission standards for new vehicles, have also contributed. The focus in the last decade have been centered on climate smart cities, transportation, and bioeconomy. A national strategy to transit to a circular economy was recently adopted. We welcome Thailand's recent adoption of a plan to ban the use of single-use plastics, plastic bags in 2021. The announced ban is good news, indeed, and we remain hopeful that Thailand can regain lost ground in the fight against single-use plastics. Furthermore, the Royal Thai government just last year took important steps in the right direction by approving the phasing out of three types of plastics, microbeads, cap seals, and oxidegradable plastics. Thailand's journey towards achieving a sustainable, green, and circular economy is also our collective journey. Swedish businesses in Thailand have been present here for many decades, and in some cases for more than a century. It should come as no surprise that the likes of ABB, Electrolux, Ericsson, IKEA, Tetra Pak, and Volvo have become stakeholders in the future development of also Thailand. Sweden looks forward to continuing working together with Thailand on these issues, as well as regionally through uh, international organizations, not the least the UN, of course. Let me conclude by wishing you all a successful event uh, with many new valuable connections. Thank you so much. Thank you, Master. And now let's hear from our strategic partner. I'd like to invite on the stage Mr. Stephen Olive, Mission Director of the Regional Development Mission for Asia, United States Agency for International Development, or USAID, to uh, deliver the speech. Thank you. Thank you, Sawadi Krop. It's really an honor to be here with our distinguished guest, His Excellency uh, Keith Radu, and His Excellency John uh, Grundal. It's, it's a pleasure to share the stage with you as well as our honored guest. And I really want to thank the multi, the multi chambers of commerce for convening us today in this really important forum. Every time I come to an event like this, um, I feel, what, I, I question my own career choice. Because when I talk to a company like Harmless Harvest, who's out there developing sustainable coconut value chains uh, that will protect our planet, et cetera, you wonder, well, and, and being an innovator of, and like all of you here, you know, I wonder, why didn't I choose this type of uh, career? Because decades ago, and when I, about the time when I was starting in the Foreign Service with USAID, the majority of development assistance to emerging economies came from governments like the US government uh, to these. Nowadays, that's been flipped on its head where the majority of capital flows going to emerging markets is coming from the private sector. And so here I am, in a job that I'm trying to work myself out of a job, and all of you are out there creating jobs and protecting our planet. Which choice did I make? 
uh, you all are in a great position, and I really admire uh, the work that all of you do, the jobs you create, and the concern for the planet. And that's why USAID's one of the sponsors here, uh, because we believe in collaborating with industry in enterprise-driven development to catalyze market shifts and decrease poverty while increasing business resilience in economic, economic and environmental shocks. In this year's World Economic Forum Global Risk Report, climate-related issues filled the top five spots of long-term risks. And COVID-19, of course, is the latest, but unlikely the last, environmental health-related risk that we all will face. In fact, half of the emerging infectious diseases in the past six decades, from COVID to SARS to Ebola to HIV AIDS, are linked to land use change, agricultural intensification, or changes in food production. Facing natural disasters, extreme weather and biodiversity loss, our value chains are at risk of fragmenting without new business models to bolster them. This is where public monies can crowd in private funds to address these challenges. As of 2018, across more than 80 countries, the U.S. government leveraged $5.5 billion in partial credit guarantees to de-risk lending for investments. Because of this, business and initiatives that otherwise would not have secured capital have launched. In January, the International Development Finance Corporation officially opened its doors as America's development bank with a $60 billion investment cap in emerging markets. The Indo-Pacific is a priority region for this work. And I was recently joined by our colleague uh, from this new corporation here in the U.S. Embassy here in Thailand. Perhaps more closely linked to this forum in sustainable business is our flagship climate finance USA Green Investment Asia project. With an eye towards lowering carbon emissions, we are facilitating debt and equity investments into sustainable land use businesses covering rice to rubber, coconuts to cacao, and more. This facility provides technical assistance, such as feasibility studies and capital matchmaking to low carbon and small and medium sized enterprises to multinational corporations committed to sustainable sourcing through their supply chains. For example, here in Thailand, we are working with the coconut water company to source sustainable coconuts. Through our assistance, Harmless Harvest now has information on the carbon footprint of their supply chain and climate suitability for future coconut plantations. And by the way, my wife is a huge fan of that. My house is full of, of a lot of uh, coconut water because of its nutrition, et cetera. And the fact that now it's being produced sustainably and we know that it's good for the environment is really a great innovative business uh, practice. We're in a period of unprecedented investment opportunities. Forward-thinking business leaders and impact investors can make climate-conscious, game-changing advancements for people, the planet, and business profit. Facilitating investments in emerging markets is difficult, but our very, su our very survival in the warming world hinges on leaders in this room responding to this historical capital call. And I'd like to introduce two of our team members from USAID um, who are implementing our program alongside of all of you as business, Angela and Kuhn Bird. Thank you for joining me today and for your great work for us. And then I'd just like to end as I applaud those of you here who invested in the strengthening their cities and their supply chains th in hope their business success spurs more needed investment. Thank you again for this opportunity to welcome you here today, and I wish you all continued luck. Kapkun Krap. Appreciate it, Mr. Olive. And we will, uh, in a short time, uh, see the video of this Green Invest Asia as well. But before that, let's.
acquaint ourselves with the, the session this afternoon uh, by having uh, on the stage uh, Ms. Achnel Lebion and Mr. Henri de Rebeau, the Malta Chamber Sustainability uh, Commerce Committee Directors and Content Coordinator for SPF uh, 20 for the introduction of this session. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today. I'm really glad we're actually able to meet in person for the fourth edition of the Sustainability for Business Forum. It was quite compromised at first. We had to change the date. Um, but here we are, uh, in person, gathered once again to explore impactful project implementations, to meet the business practitioners behind innovations for greater good, and to ignite new partnerships for environmental and social impact. Some of the businesses that you'll meet today are further down their sustainability journey, disrupting the status quo and pushing the boundaries of business models. Others are on a more transformational journey, optimizing their processes, their operations, and their products from gray to green. But all in all, all of us here hold a common belief that the state of the world needs repair and that the business sector holds a major role in steering the direction to our human and planet welfare. Every year we aim to deliver content which is timely, which responds to local and global challenges, and is actionable here and now. We could not speak about sustainability without speaking about the COVID crisis. Firstly, because the two are deeply intertwined, as we realize that the health of our planet is a prerequisite for ours. But also because while the economy has been put on a stop, our social and environmental distress have not been put on lockdown. It is now more crucial than ever to rethink our businesses within our ecological limits and human welfare to foster our own resiliency long term. SBF 20 will be an opportunity to explore ideas for a new normal written in greener and more inclusive terms. Ahmed Aguil is here. We have to talk about COVID-19. COVID-19 and the, on the restriction the government are making on the economy have a tremendous impact on the economy here in Thailand and the region. And to, to many sectors, to the company we're working with, and to our life. Many lost their jobs, and still people who still have the jobs, they have to struggle to run the company. The, the prices are going down, the volume are going down, the margin are going down. So to get your company to survive, you have to work harder and harder. It's tough, we don't know wh when it will be finished. So I don't know what you think in such a situation. We all look, look for hopeful protective. That's what we're trying to do in this forum, to bring to you hopeful and positive perspective in terms of business, also in terms of meaning, in terms of purpose for our business, for our work. We'll be listening some great managers, great innovators who are bringing sustainability and solutions to social environment challenges to the core of the business operations and business models. Inspirational speakers who will share the ideas, the enthusiasm, their courage to move forward. So Amel will explain all these all the speakers will be organized by track. Yes, so the first track will be about cities and will be in ballroom number two over there. Uh, so cities are home to more than 55% of the population. We basically rely on them for quite a lot of things, for jobs, for services, for education, healthcare, research, entertainment, and culture. And they're centers for innovation, technological, technological progress, but also really great human networks. But as they combine so many talents, they're also more vulnerable to crisis and to the growing effects of climate change. Today, we have a really true opportunity to stimulate our economy to actually support the transition of these cities towards decarbonization and to create integrated management manage neighborhoods that are going to generate jobs that actually create social and environmental value. Today, we'll sp be specifically speaking about how sustainable, smart, and resilient cities actually promote green economy and a green recovery. And we're going to be hearing uh, from our business leaders here in Thailand about Thailand implemented solution for renewable energy generation, energy storage and decentralization, urban e-mobility, circularity in cities, tech for good, but also the revival of our green areas. The second track 
we will be looking into beauty and the fashion industry and it will be held in meeting number, uh, room number six, so uh, across the hallway. Um, so in both of these sectors, uh, have been, we've been seeing in the past decades a lot of positive change. They've been shifting from uh, having uh, toxic production processes to toxic free ingredients. From encouraging fast fashion and mass consumerism to promoting responsible purchasing. And they've also been improving the working conditions of their workers and supporting local com uh, communities and their economies. We'll be today speaking about the, how the beauty and the fashion industry is actually taking climate action, moving towards circularity, and we're gonna be hearing about sustainability pioneers, about their um, innovations in uh, design, in packaging, and in products, which is offering us consumers the, cho the choice to access better products. On the same track on, li on sustainable lifestyle, after the coffee break, we'll have two amazing duos, business duos. The first one is a company which beautifully designing interior items from the used walking tools from the poorest of the poor, the small fishermen. The second duo will be from Moloop? Yeah, <laughs> from Moloop, with, with uh, a very famous company here in Thailand, which is moving to bringing services to a secular economy and partnering with a startup social enterprise to recycle tons of leftover from the garment industry. The third track name is Food of the Future. We'll go on here in this room. You are being supported by, by Green Invest Asia. The first panel after this session will be with four speakers. One executive for international company and one famous chef has identified the consumer food emerging demands and the future of trends in that sector. And two CEOs of very innovative Thai companies are addressing these demands by in terms of health, in terms of impact on the environment, and in terms of integration of communities. After the coffee break, you have one small panel having the best in class companies with uh, regarding to responsible supply chain, one very famous international companies and one small companies successfully being a social and sustainable enterprise that we already mentioned by Mr. Luhe. The second uh, small session will be with a um, committed to sustainability tech supplier helping a Thai company to assess the imp social imp environment impact from their food supplier. To end, the day will be again here in a plenary session, a CEO panel with um, the real executive of a very famous international brand in beauty, the very passionate CEO of a Thai innovative food company, and the CEO of a renewable, ener renewable energy company in the region. All these three speakers will share how they make sustainability a key component of their relation to stakeholders, on their strategy, on the competitive advantage, on the vision for the future. I think you're right to be here in Bangkok. And the people who are connected for Ho Chi Minh, Phnom Penh, Singapore, Paris, London, and Amsterdam are right too. I think it will be a great afternoon. I wish you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alpel and Aubrey, for the introduction to uh, the uh, way the SBF20 is being designed for the most productive session that we're going to have this afternoon. And uh, before we take a group photo, uh, we have a short presentation of our strategic partner, uh, USAID, on Green Invest Asia. Let's take a look. USA Green Invest Asia is a new kind of initiative. In order to forge sustainable change in agribusiness and forestry, to manage environmental risks and reduce carbon emissions,
apology for the uh, technical error. So to save time, we'll proceed with the photo session first, and then uh, we'll continue with the video presentation. We still have time until the evening. So uh, may I invite once again on the stage, Ambassador Case, Ambassador Grandal, and uh, Mr. Olive, Mr. Stephen Olive, Mr. Olivier Richard from uh, French Embassy, Chargé d'Affaires, and representing Franco Thai Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Thomas Sanchez, Mr. Hans van den Born, Executive Director of the Netherlands Thai Chamber of Commerce, Kunpotjana Pathmater, um, Executive Director USA Green of the Swedish Thai Chamber of Commerce, Kun On Anon Prathak Piriya, Corporate Communications and Public Affairs, L'Oreal, Thailand, Ms. Ahmel Lebiong and Mr. Ongwi De Rebu, Multi Chamber Sustainability Committee Directors, and all the uh, representatives of our sponsors and uh, our supporters. Please join us as well. In order Thank you, Excellencies and uh, distinguished guests. And uh, the video is ready before we uh, send you out to the uh, breakout sessions. Let's take a look at this video, Green Invest Asia. USA Green Invest Asia is a new kind of initiative. In order to forge sustainable change in agribusiness and forestry, to manage environmental risks and reduce carbon emissions, we are working directly with business and financial institutions across Asia. USA Green Invest Asia is part of USAID's long-running investment into more sustainable land use. For years, there's been a lot of focus on government and NGOs working around very small-scale, community-level work or on policy. But more recently, there has been a growing understanding that the private sector and financial institutions are key to finding solutions that create real impact and change. USAID Green Invest Asia links investors and financial institutions with profitable, low-emission agriculture and forestry companies. We partner with companies to support sustainable sourcing goals, attract new investors, and transform how land is used for the everyday products we rely on. Our aim is to mobilize private finance to reduce carbon emissions by attracting $400 million of private finance and a reduction of carbon emissions of 25 million tons. There's an understanding that what we've been doing isn't enough. We need to bring more actors to bear to address the challenge. From smallholder farmers to a large corporation, it's not always easy for them to work together but they rely on each other. They need each other to be more successful and sustainable. With the SDGs and the Paris Agreement, more, more companies, companies are setting, setting targets and shifting, shifting their business practices, practices towards more sustainable, sustainable agriculture, agriculture and, and forestry. forestry. Sustainability, Sustainability also, also makes, makes good, good business, business sense. sense. Asia's, Asia's population, population is booming, and, and this means more, more food is needed, needed, and it and needs to be to produced, produced in a sustainable, sustainable way with environmental and social safeguards. And the food, and the food challenge, challenge is, is only one side. side. On, the On the other side, side is the role of land use change, change through deforestation of core agricultural practices, practices which create 40% of greenhouse, greenhouse gas, gas emissions, emissions in Asia. Asia. So the so issues, the issues are, pressing. are pressing. They are urgent. urgent. At USA At Green Invest Asia, Asia, we believe that through building partnerships, partnerships the resources are there to create real change. change. Talk to us about how we can work together. I'm sure we have enough time to uh, study about uh, USAID and the Green Invest Asia. Uh, they're with us today outside uh, in the foyer. So now I'm sending all of you to the uh, breakout sessions. We have uh, three sessions. 
So this ballroom will be divided into two. Uh, ballroom two will be the second half of this room. That will be uh, where we'll have the, uh, the session on smart and sustainable cities in the ballroom two, which is the uh, second half. It'll give us a few minutes to uh, set up the partition. And uh, second track, which is the sustainable lifestyles and fashion and beauty, will be held in the meeting room six, which is across the foyer on the same floor. And the third and the last track is the food of the future. It will be in this ballroom, this part of the ballroom. And uh, we'll be back in this room uh, for the uh, uh, panel discussion and the CEO panel discussion at 5 p.m. That will be a lucky draw at the end of the session. Uh, hopefully you'll be lucky. And uh, the networking, uh, the cocktail reception starts at 6 p.m. So uh, enjoy your breakout sessions and see you back at 5 p.m. Thank you very much. Testing. Um, and then we'll start the program. A package should save more than it costs. At Tetra Pak, we know this idea well. It is a defining part of our story. Today, food is processed and packaged for improved quality with a longer shelf life and can be transported anywhere. More people have access to safe food, helping improve health and well-being. But our planet still suffers. Natural resources are being depleted, greenhouse gas emissions are rising, food waste continues, and pollution persists. 
Every decision we make starts with a promise, protects what's good. It's the reason we continue to innovate with our customers to realize our vision. We commit to making food safe and available everywhere. And now it's time to renew our promise. In a fast-changing world with more people to feed, consumer preferences evolving, and the threat of climate change looming, protecting what's good has never been more important. So we're renewing our commitment to protect food by continuing to pioneer quality solutions that ensure food is kept safe all the way from farm to table and can reach the furthest corners of the world. To protect people by collaborating, learning and building on our expertise to support our customers and communities everywhere. And to protect our planet by tackling climate change and contributing to the circular economy, using more renewable materials, reducing emissions across the value chain, working to prevent food waste, increasing recyclability and much more. We want to show people around the world what our promise is all about. Because at Tetra Pak, we don't only protect food, we protect what's good. Thank you. Um, welcome to the panel on food innovation. What we eat and how we get it is one of the biggest drivers of carbon emissions, water pollution, deforestation, not to mention more direct and immediate impacts on human health. Our current systems are simply unsustainable, but things are changing. Our four panelists today are all in the business of food, and we'll talk about innovations in their industries and we are where we are headed in the future. Each of the panelists will give us a brief presentation, then we'll move on to a discussion. We'll close with questions from the audience. Our first panelist is Mr. Bert Jan Post, MD of Tetra Pak. You have a presentation for us? Yes. Um, Svarika, good afternoon. Um, thank you first and foremost for inviting and having us here in this uh, panel. Um, you, um, it was a good start to start with the video and you saw um, a, a few things that I would like to reiterate and then afterwards we can go into the questions. Um, Tetra Pak protects what's good. I'll come back on that. But our mission, what we have, our, our vision is make food safe and available everywhere. And that's basically what we are doing. Tetra Pak's business is based on food is in one place, and as was expressed by earlier speakers, cities are growing, food has to go to a different place in a way that is smart, that is efficient, that keeps the food good, and in a sustainable way. And I've been working for Tetra Pak for a long time, and I can say that um, basically since the beginning a long time ago, sustainability, one way or the other, has been part of our business. It's in our, I would say, in our genes. Um, I want to share with you a few thoughts about two areas. You know, we talk my, make food safe and available, then you talk about consumers, you know, consuming the food. Just a few remarks on what's happening on the consumer level, and then talk a little bit what we are doing. Because at this moment, the world is changing. Um, COVID-19 is on our minds, but there's many other things that are changing. The public is becoming aware that we cannot do what we did. We have to make changes. Um, we have investigated globally so what are the major trends that we see now related to food and food consumption. And I just picked out three that are related to sustainability, food, and you know, the future. Um, the first one is that health and sustainability are not independent things anymore. And are not an option anymore either. It's health and sustainability. And if you look at the, the, the analysis, the details of this, it is amazing to see the change that we see, particularly with younger people. They don't accept that something is not healthy or not sustainable. In the past, you could say health comes later when I you know, become older. Sustainability, you know, the options are not there anymore. So they realize that it's different. That means for companies that we have to do different things. We have to communicate that we have health in our products and that it is sustainable. And there are many examples of those. The second one that I would like to highlight is heritage and provenance. You know, connecting to what is close, connecting to what is real. 
and I think you probably, you know, some of the other speakers will talk about it as well. You know, that is something that is very um, relevant for um, restaurants, and but it's also important for people that are in packed food that we are, you know, we're in the value chain that we are in. And it should be done in a way that is trustworthy. And there the third element comes into play, big data. It's not only Facebook and Instagram. You know, nowadays you can do with QR codes, you can do tracking and tracing. And you can't fake it. Because social media will expose very quickly if you do different from what you promise. So health is important and sustainability both, and definitely with the younger age groups, but you know, they will make the older age groups aware that they have to change as well. Be real, and it can be checked. So this is on the consumer side. Then a few words on the business side. Um, Tetra Pak is known as a big company for packaging, um, um, and there's a lot of packaging. We will go out with this message more and more. Go nature, go cotton. And why do we dare to do this? You know, this is an announcement of our ambition to be the most sustainable package in the world. Today, I dare to say we are not in a bad spot. 70% of our packages is renewable. Paper, coming from certified forest. We're working with FSC, all our packs. But we have to do more. We have to get this other 30% to be or renewable or something that is recycled. That's our ambition. That's a big technology request on us, and we are putting a lot of money into this um, on a global level. That doesn't stop to work on local level. On local level, we work as well in time with many partners on the end of life. Recycling, making sure we get it back and do something very concrete with this. So this is something that you will see more. It will be a soft launch. We don't go above the line, but the idea that carton is good, lots more to be done, we would like to bring into society. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, our next second panelist is going to be um, Jeff Schultz. He is the CEO of Smith. Hello. Hi. Okay. Uh, my name is Smith uh, from Let's Plant Meat. So I'd like to tell you about what we do. Uh, can I go? Uh, okay, here's a picture. I like the New Yorker uh, cover page. You are slicing something out of what we love, the planet, right? Something about the meat consumption that we love to eat. I think people would like to eat more proteins these days. And if you look at that, the facts about meat production consume 83% of the farmland used more than three quarter of the land growing the foods for animal and then we eat animal from that. And then 27% of the fresh water consumption go to meat and dairy industries. And we don't have the second planet to live. We're looking about right now, right? And this is something where uh, closer to, to, the, to here, this is the picture of deforested mountain in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And this is 420 is the AQI uh, microgram per cubic meter in Chiang Mai alone ev in around like December to March of every year. Because farmers who grow corn, once they harvest the corn, they burn the fields to grow something else. And the corn go to who? Not to us, but go to animal feed industries. And the burning doesn't stop in Chiang Mai. The red dot is the satellite image, uh, satellite data on where it burned. This is the northern Thailand, and you see like the n further b the border is everywhere. Because we love to eat the meat, so farmer continue to grow the corn or the other, other, uh, other livestock feeding crops. And this is where we try to say to the people in the hills, say, hey, can you stop burning? Can you like come down and give other jobs and can you grow something else? But we are people in the city, we still continue to eat shabu shabu and like a lot of buffet meat uh, products. Uh, so we're thinking, what if we can offer consumers something that tastes like the meat we like, but there's also giving some environmentally friendly benefits. This comes something called plant-based meat, where we imitating, replicating the texture and taste of animal meat, but it's wholly made out of plant ingredients. 
This is where you can see the, the company like Beyond Meat and Impossible Food that making inroad for a lot of uh, restaurant consumer in around the world. And what about Asia, right? Are we going to buy something that costs half as much of, of our daily wage, right, in, 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 in Thailand? So this is something where I'd like to make sure that Asia participates in this, uh, this movement. So we're looking at creating the plant-based meat from uh, our local Thailand research company in here in Chiang Mai, and then we're starting to offer something like minced meat based, where you can do like a prow and some other Asian stuff, and also in the future something that, uh, some something that people or the world uh, will want from Asia. Asian food is something that people love around the world, and can we make it plant based, and a lot of meat uh, cuisine can come from Asia that people will love too. And I like to, uh, to stop here, uh, because we can talk more about this, but this is something where uh, we want to participate in the movement of plant-based meat and want to grow the adoption, to grow the, to grow the like awareness that whatever we choose to eat can also contribute to our planet's sustainability. Thank you. Uh, so I don't have a slide for you guys, but uh, a little bit about us. Berlin, we are a small restaurant. We do roughly 50 covers, well, pre-COVID we did 50 covers a day. And uh, our main goal is to source the best quality produce for our consumers. But by doing that, we slowly realized that the choices we were making on a very simple level were affecting much more than just our restaurant and the consumers in our restaurant. That was affecting our farmers and the communities those farmers lived in. So we've, over the years, looked at ways in which we can reduce our carbon footprint, reduce our social impact, and try and improve the lives of everybody involved in the process. Um, we do that a lot through waste reduction and different initiatives we run at the restaurant. And I think we're going to talk about them later. Yeah? <laughs> so uh, that's me. Thanks so much, Dylan. And finally, we have Mr. Arwin Narula, who's the founder and CEO of Ermat. So thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Zahn. Thanks for having me here today. I actually speak around the world on sustainability, poverty alle alleviation uh, through business. And this is the first time I'm Thai. I'm a Thai citizen. This is the first time I've spoken in Thailand. So thank you for the opportunity. So I'm one of the old guys uh, in sustainability. I've been at it since 1982 in Thailand. And uh, I run a bunch of companies in, a in the agricultural space up in the north of Chiang Rai. We have also done operations in Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, uh, Sierra Leone, Argentina, where we still have an operation. Uh, all of these are in organic agriculture. So I'm one of the oldest organic agriculture innovators uh, and uh, impact investors in Asia. We continue, uh, I, I realized way back, so I'll tell you a very quick story. We owned a lot of land in the old days in Chiang Rai. And one day I saw one of my farmers who was spraying the fields with a baby pack. He was carrying a baby while he was had a, a, a DDT or whatever packed at the back while he was spraying it. And I was my son was small at that time, and uh, I said, you know, that's not tolerable for me to watch this man who works for us uh, killing his child. And within a year, we became organic. And this these were early days, and we haven't changed since then. We. We are Thailand's and the world's largest organic jasmine rice producer, one of the largest organic overall, overall rice producers in the world. Uh, we are Thailand's uh, largest and the first organic eggs producer. Uh, the ambassador earlier was talking about harmless harvest. We are in organic uh, coconuts uh, and, and a bunch of other things. We have uh, value-added products. We innovate in every which way. Uh, we do. We are zero waste oriented, zero emissions where possible, uh, very close to zero. Everything we do, 
We lose the entire plant. And uh, I'd be happy to talk to, do we have slides here? I, sorry. <laughs> so that's us. Uh, that will probably tell you more than I can say. Uh, whoops, too fast. Uh, Kun Smith just went over that. And now we're developing packaging material. And I, I just know that Treasure Back soon talk to me after that, after this, wanting some of our stuff. Uh, from rice straw, and we think we can stop both the burning in Asia as well as uh, a no tree product, no tree kill product. Uh, that's one of the prototypes we've made from pure rice straw, no additives, nothing. And we hope to start a movement. We hope other people will copy us and take this uh, Southeast Asia wide where all the burning is every year. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm going to start with the first question. I think you guys will each have a different perspective on it. And that is, for you in your business, what have been the main drivers of innovation in food towards sustainability? And if you could take the first one, and then we'll just go down the line. The main, the main driver for sustainability in our business. Yeah, I think sustainability, um, uh, in the way we are a Swedish company. I think sustainability and respect for nature has always been there. I think, you know, what we, one of the biggest challenges that we have is to balance the need for protection, you know, because that's what we're trying to provide, with the resources we take from nature. And I think the work that has been done over the years, um, it started that with um, certification forestry making sure, because you talk about burning of trees, we say that we have renewable resources. Now, that is only can be renewable if the forest trees are properly managed. So that is one of the first steps we do. Um, I think that the biggest challenge that we have at this moment that um, where we are working on is to change the technology that we use um, into something that has a lower carbon footprint. The biggest carbon footprint, it's a bit technical, but our packages are carton, a little bit polyethylene, and a little bit aluminum. Very little, 5%, hair, hair thick. But we have to get it out. So these are the things that we have. So we started on the paper side. Now we really look into a complete renewable package in the future. Um, and then just to follow up, so would you say that most of the innovation drive is coming from inside the company, or are you seeing it coming from consumers? For you guys being a Swedish company, I'm assuming that the regulatory landscape is a little bit stricter for you. W when you look at those three different things, internal, consumers, and regulatory, where are the main, where's the main push coming from? I think internal and, and consumers. I mean, the regulations, I think, in many countries are, you know, I think sometimes they even look at us, too, to write them up. And I think there are, of course, now the landscape is a little bit changing. And this is particularly where the single-use plastic legislation comes into place. Um, driven in Europe, um, where we are, of course, fully committed to abide by the new regulation that come in place, and as many things are there done to uh, make sure that we are fully. But I think in the years that I work in Tetra Pak, I can't remember that before the single-use plastic comes in, which is actually targeting less us than other packaging formats, that we were driven by legislation. It was by opportunities, by listening to consumers, and being and wanting to be a good company. Dylan? Uh, I think our driving factor is that it's the right thing to do. I mean, when we look at all the practices we've implemented, it just makes sense for us to do it so that we can sleep at night. But, but in your industry, certainly it hasn't been that easy. And you're one of the, I would say, you're at the forefront of some of the innovation. So I think, I mean, looking at it, honestly, restaurants, especially higher-end restaurants, they're disgustingly wasteful. I mean, people come in and spend a lot of money for small portions of food that requires a lot of preparation, a lot of waste. So for us, we tried to make it so it was educational for the customer as well in order to tell them like this is less wasteful because of this, this and this and because of our sourcing policies and also through different programs we run either with uh, scholars and uh, universities or with actual producers ourselves by 
returning or closing the loop and looking at the restaurant as a series of systems as opposed to this is our problem. So for example, uh, we use a lot of charcoal on our charcoal grill. We want to get rid of that charcoal, so we also make a lot of coconut cream. So now we're working with Ajah Mungtip from Kasetsa University, and she's helping us through a scholarship program with her students develop a way in which we can get a model to make charcoal out of our used coconut, but then give that model to communities in order for them to produce it and sell it to us. So uh, stuff like that for us is really exciting and makes us sort of get us out of bed each day. Thank you. And Smith, I know that your Let's Plant Meat is part of a larger food organization. So can you talk a little bit about what sure, the driver sure. was for that? Okay, uh, so we're part of a family company business in spices in Chiang Mai. So we do like garlic pepper, chili powder, and then we do uh, seasoning powder where we're mixing a lot of spices and creating like formulation on the marination of meat or snacks things. And one other thing is we use, uh, we want to make sure that we want like kind of innovate. So one thing we want to innovate based on like food scientific discovery, like food technology, food science. And we, we want to shift our focus on labor intensive to be more knowledge intensive. And that's where we read so much and we observe and we ask questions on ourselves. One thing is if we were to utilize our scientific uh, people to do something meaningful, what are it, right? What is it? And we, we, we we constantly face a problem of the burning in Chiang Mai for the past seven years. And every time people want to fix that problem, they try to do it on the supply side. Can you give something to farmers to grow? Can you bring them down from the hill? Can you uh, don't support the, 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 the growing? But then nobody talk about the demand side where, where that supply chain end up. So by constantly reading it and asking the question, you see this could be something where we can be a part of change. And if we have scientific uh, ability, would we want to be part of that equation of change by not just being a bystander, hey, I just give you donation of, of like 10,000 a baht and do something. But this is something where we want to make something from the grassroots that we can make an impact, starting from a uh, small part that eventually, if we don't see a connection that we don't have the burning soon, but it is something where we create the awareness of people when they choose to eat a dish, the meat that you like, can you reduce that? a little bit and find the uh, other option that can also help lengthen the life of our planet. It is something where we want to, it's a driving force of question and try to answer it ourselves. Robert. So for us, mo most of our innovation and drive is internal. Uh, I think consumers are, uh, when they make decisions, they don't have enough information uh, as to the choices really available to them. Uh, so we focus on on changing it f from the farm level in, in the food industry. So for example, uh, uh, the Hill Tribe Organic Eggs, uh, it's a company it's of pure passion. M m no, no business uh, plan would be uh, accepted by any banker, the, the plan that we have. We've lost money for seven years uh, and we continue. But it's changed the lives of the hill tribes and they stopped the very burning that Kunsmet is talking about because we have given them an opportunity to treble and quadruple the incomes uh, using a model that we developed and uh, uh, we can trace every egg back to every farmer and that gives the farmer a pride uh, because he's on our websites, they have no electricity, no running water, uh, they didn't, didn't have schools, we, we've provided a lot of all that. But this, the sheer joy of being able to make a community-based community and environmental-based change, and that's just the smallest example of the different uh, businesses we're in. So we, we see a you know, magnificent pride uh, in the people we work with, 3,000 families who work with us, and, and the, how their lives have changed. They've been with us for decades, and because we guarantee them higher incomes because we tell them that you s stop poisoning yourselves, your families, the earth, uh, when stopping all the chemicals that uh, are used in farms. And, and that drives us, that, that pushes us to greater innovation, to use every part of the plant, to use every piece of the farmland available f to increase the revenues and create even more jobs and even more safe food 
uh, within our own systems. So actually, hold on to that microphone, because I want to follow up, and then maybe we can all address this. So we're talking about sustainability in business, and you've just told us that Hill Tribe Eggs hasn't turned a profit for seven years. Can you talk about what the horizon looks like um, and whether it will be doing so in the future and how important that is when you're innovating um, in order to create business models that are sustainable as well? So in, in, in this particular, uh, this is a passion project. It's more of a social enterprise. So it, we broke even uh, recently, but, and that's a happy situation for us. And we're happy to try and keep it at break even. We're not looking for profit in, in the Hill Tribes project. And uh, hopefully Bolan uses our eggs. Uh, if not, <laughs> if not, we'll pelt you. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, it's, on all the other businesses that we have, they're all profit-driven. As as I said, I speak around the world, and the one thing that drives sustainability is profit. We humans, who have had the education, and those who haven't, are driven mightily by making money. So, and there are answers. There are answers. You know, we, the, the big project that we have, uh, we're launching right now, a colleague of mine, Braz, is sitting right here, uh, to make packaging material from straw. We want to stop the burning. Our farmers and their children breathe this stuff three months every year. We want to stop that. And the only way to stop it is to tell the farmers, We'll give you money if you don't burn your fields. We, all of our farmers who are inorganic, somehow a lot of them burn it and they say somebody else burned it to come and catch the, the field mice at night to eat. That's not true. They're burning it because the, uh, po the farmer population is aging. They don't want to have to go through the work to have to harrow the fields, et cetera, yada, yada. So the only answer is profit. I'm part of a, a think tank, global think tank, that's looking for a solution to the ocean plastics. And I turned this whole uh, process of approaching, working a little bit with the July University here, the entire process around stop looking at this as a problem. Think uh, it's in international waters. Think of it as if you discovered oil, millions of tons of it. Now what are you going to do with it? And we have come up with a few solutions, and we're looking for mega bucks to function to fund that to try and get it get that out of the way thank you and smith can you talk about the um business case for meat alternatives in light of your of let's plant meat uh, the investment that you've made whether you want to talk about profitability what the horizon all right. is for uh, okay so i think the alternative protein is the hot sector right now for like the ag tech and food tech industry a lot of uh investor is looking around the next big uh, thing and kind of like thank you that we will be part here and then uh, because of the, the the momentum the industry is creating uh, I don't think that the demand in Asia is like large because Asian is living with the plant-based uh, alternative for a long time like tofu and mushroom and other things like soy based things and then, but these other things have the stigma of like, uh, is the old age, is a refrain from, so you don't have that good tasting. Everything that claimed to be healthy will be less taste, and that people don't want. And we want to change that stigma. And this is something where, how can we offer tasty product and also like not to like burden your wallet and also try to create the, the better sense on your, on your health and sustainabilities. Uh, I think with volume, with acceptance of consumer, I think the, uh, uh, it will change. I think it start to pick up. The first thing that we, we want to solve is the price accessibility, right? To import it from Europe and uh, USA is not something that major of Thai people can, can access. We want to make sure it produced in Thailand. It's a conscious choice that we use soy because soy is one thing you can talk about soy is GMO, but we don't use the GMO soy. And soy is a few crop where it started burning, but the soy is something that when you harvest, you can plow it back to retain nitrogen into the field, and it's something that you can create. Uh, but people are, a lot of people like say is allergic to soy, but people in Asia, we live with soy for the past few thousand years, and we know soy. And if we can make soy, it doesn't, doesn't smell like soy, and then taste like meat, this is something where we can start making 
I call, I call a dent in the meat universe and we we'll try small, small thing. So for you, it's a long-term investment? Is that what you're saying? To yeah, it's, it's a long-term investment where we want to create adoption. And I think the volume should start pick up. Uh, I mean, this vegetarian festival in next week where people, everybody in Thailand will try to eat, to try to eat vegetarian for the, for the nine days, right? I want this to, after you try it, and then you want to continue to do more. This is something where if you don't have the demand, where the supply would not make profitability. This is where we have to, like chicken and egg thing, we have technology, where we have the market to offer that. A lot of times we're looking at, like people in Thailand don't cook at home. They're looking at eating at restaurants and how can restaurants can be part of this by like, incorporating this plant-based meat on their menu. This is something where I want to see one page having plant-based option with tofu, mushroom, and other meat alternative where they can enjoy with friends that still continue eating meat and that their life should not be that difficult. And Dylan, um, for Bolan, can you talk about the business case for embracing sustainability? Has it helped the business or is it costing you more? Or uh, Some of the programs cost us more, but most of it actually saves us money. We're essentially making our business more efficient. So therefore, we get more work out of our staff and therefore more profitability. But also, we're saving money because, for example, we use our, uh, all our citrus scraps. We make a lot of fresh lime juice every day. The citrus scraps, get, we turn them into pectin, and then that pectin we put into a cleaning agent that we make ourselves from our other fruits that we ferment with some sugar and make an EM out of it. And so this is really low tech, low uh, investment for us, but instead of buying in harsh chemicals to use in the restaurant, we can actually clean the whole restaurant by producing our own cleaning agents. We also take our oil and turn our oil into soap, and that soap we use to wash the whole kitchen, use it to wash our hands, we haven't quite developed one that doesn't smell like shallots yet, so we can't give it to the customers, <laughs> but we're working on like liquidizing it and giving it to the customers as well. These things save us money, and therefore we can spend that money on other things in the restaurant, like putting our solars on top or putting an ochen in the back, which is a biodigester, stuff like that. This costs a lot of money, and those things won't pay us back for the life of the restaurant. But when you talk about the ochen, which is, a, I guess, a composting machine, yeah. What was the motivation for doing that, despite the fact that you said it, it won't pay you back, pay for itself in the, during the life <coughs> of the restaurant? Um, well, we, we've been separating our waste for about four or five years now, and we're separating it and then sending it onto this curb, and realized that everything we separated just got thrown back into the back of one truck. So we wanted to come up with a better alternative for that, and we've come up with a mission statement of zero waste to landfill. So the easiest way to get rid of a lot of our food waste was to compost. We started composting by ourselves in uh, homemade bins, like double bins and doing that, that sort of method. But that created new problems for us, like um, smell, but also infestation. So lots of maggots, lots of hungry rats decided to come off the street because there's better food to have in our bins. So we need to come up with a more efficient way in which we could process our food waste, the food waste that we can't upcycle. Uh, for us, composting is the last option, so to speak, but we still have the capacity to compost 80 kilos a day. At the moment, we're probably composting 30, 40 kilos a day based on two restaurants and two bars operating out of the one space. Uh, but that compost then we put back into our permaculture garden. We also ship it off to our farmers as well. And Bert Jan, can you talk about? Yeah, no, maybe if there's a few comments about uh, what you talked about, uh, plant-based, because it's a very hot topic. Um, not only for meat, and by the way, meat is very successful in Europe. Like Unilever bought a company and, you know, they take the technology and now bring it like mainstream. And, you know, in the West, I think it is different than here in Thailand, um, but the acceleration of plant-based and coming from a boring, non-tasting product that I have to eat to something that is attractive, that's gone, it's accelerating. And I think the science here in this part of the world, I talked about the trends, and they are the trends are impacting product development of our customers. So we spend a lot of energy with our customers to develop what the package board you put in the package. And if I look at the discussion that we have, it's more on plant based than on dairy. Dairy, yes, sure, and you know, and then different taste, but plant based, new. And it's not because we want to reduce cost, no, we want to create some value because there are consumers out there that have been educated by, you know, their peers by, you know, Netflix that are very interesting, you know, things on there that plant-based is not bad and you can be a top 
athletes are doing it. So people want to do it. And then you get very hip brands, like Oatly. So soya has always been here. But now in Thailand, you know, almond, now Oatly or oat-based products. If you go to um, Starbucks nowadays, and the latest thing that they have, I think the last month, and behind the counter you can find this Oatly. That's imported from here. Why is it not coming from here? Why is the soy that is being the organic soy, by the way, that um, Starbucks is using in Thailand imported from California? So, you know, so there is a, let's say, an international drive of doing this in consumption. And I think there's a big opportunity for Thai producers to take that space in Thailand, but it's very not the Asian countries, because it's not only Thailand. It's all over Asia where we see this trend developing. Um, and now the other question about the fuck itself. Um, you know, first, um, um, the, 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 the development or, you know, do we do this, is it a cost or is it an opportunity? You know, sustainability. I think it's something, it's a very hard business necessity, I would say. You know, if you want to be in the front, if you want to be leading, if you want to exist in 20 years from now, you can't ignore and you think it goes away. So it is something that we don't have a choice. I think, you know, many companies look at two different things nowadays. You don't have a choice to do something in the digital space and to do something in the sustainability space. But it's very hard to define exactly what you have to do now. I think we have now developed a roadmap that we know what we have to do. And we are doing it. We do it step by step, based on good heritage. What is still a big opportunity is sometimes to get the rest of the value chain along. Because not everybody sees in me that needs to be done. And definitely, if you make those changes, you create some difficulties, some change. But I don't think it's an, it's, it is an option. I think it is an absolute thing that we have to do. And if you do it right, you remain leading. And it's critical for your future business success. OK, thank you, guys. Um, we have about 15 minutes left now. And I'd like to open up questions from the audience. Um, can I just get a sense of wh whether or if anybody has any questions so we can, anybody? No, we have, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so can you take the microphone? Could you just introduce yourself quickly? Yes, uh, my, my name is Horst Witzerek. I'm origin German, but uh, I'm also on the board of the Danish Chamber, so I'm in two functions here. And I work in the insurance industry. And for us, it's also very important to see what's going on just in sustainable things. But personally, I'm very interested in this. And um, my question is, what is uh, the innovation to change the customer's behavior in using what we all here now and what you are th all thinking about. So how, how you want to motivate uh, customers to change the behavior? Because now the market is uh, like this, the people buy the cheapest things, the people, uh, if the, the meat got cheaper when I, when I grew up, the price was the same than now. And um, so how you can motivate uh, customers to change the behavior? Maybe if, if uh, yeah, I can say just one thing. I think there is a big segment in the market that is interested in sustainable products. You know, if you look and we talk about, you know, um, in, in big meat, cheap, uh, big volumes of meat, very cheap, there will be a group of people that have this. But I can see that, and it comes from the younger age onwards, people demand from brands, and it is in food going slower than in other brands. But honestly, they want to have that those products are produced in a way that they can well, I would say they don't, they, they're not opposed to it. And by this, so I would challenge you that that is not coming a, a, a that is not a current that um, it's going to happen because the young people see that it is required. Smith, could I, yeah. I, I, I sure, okay. Uh, to answer your question, I think that the, the driving force of sustainability is one, uh, come from education. If people are get to know, read, listen, I think based on social media, if you can create the, the, the right content to know that behind the food you eat, the behind the packaging you choose, behind the lifestyle you, you're, you're, you're selecting to have, it have consequence. And people with education can relate to that. For the meat part, I think people, meat is a sign of wealth. 
people who are just having money, they want to eat more of the protein before they eat, eat beans. Now they want to eat the real flesh. And this is something where let them eat a little bit until we, the education catch up. And we can ask the industry try to help telling the story to each other. And one other thing where it will be what I call it inevitability, where when 2050s comes, when population grows so huge and we don't have enough of the resources to produce, and meat will become something of a luxury, that you only ha need to have a lot of money to eat the meat from animal, and then people other other people have to eat something from plant or from something else. And this is where the industry is moving, not to uh, to to get the consumer to eat it, but to make sure that we have the the enough food to produce. In the in the conversion level, where is is what call it warrant the food source for our p future population? So, uh, meat uh, the the uh, meat substitutes already. You don't have to uh, teach the world too much. It's it's everywhere already. Uh, is one of the fastest growing food products. Uh, it's already double-digit growth uh, for the past three years uh, on a very small basis, but it's ballooning. Uh, and it's not only vegetable source meats, it's lab-based meats. And as I don't know if some of you are aware that uh, there's, a, there's a couple of corporations now uh, making uh, proteins. It's not meat, it's protein, the industry. So a couple of... I, I talk funny. So a couple of corporations have already uh, begun extracting or fermenting from carbon-based, carbon dioxide actually, into protein. So there's a lot of innovation coming and animals on the way out, no question about it. Dylan, did you want to add anything to that? Well, I mean, from my perspective, I think, how do you engage the customer? I think the easiest thing is to be genuine and honest. I think in this day and age, people smell bullshit a mile away. And there's so much greenwashing on the market from all levels, from small business to large business, and people just know. So I think if you can actually execute and do what you say you are doing, people will know, and they can then believe in you and you build trust in your brand. Any other questions? I'm Manuel Madani, I'm, I'm with the NCC. I've been here working in Thailand in the agro agriculture industry for 10 years. My question is also about meat. Um, do you believe it will cross the chasm eventually to the vast majority? Uh, because today, like, substitutes for meats is quite expensive. And how do you, how do you envision that? Is it a trend or would it, would it eventually decline? <laughs> Uh, meat options or plant-based options for meat aren't expensive. Traditional wisdom and traditional culinary heritage is already in place for thousands of years, offering people high-protein diets without very much protein or very much animal protein at all. Uh, it's available in Chiang Mai through the form of Tour Mao and things like this. It's down south in the form of fermentation. It's all available. It's just that we've lost track or lost a connection with our food systems and we've lost a connection with how to cook. People don't cook anymore. So if people start cooking more, people will start understanding how their food is produced and then they'll make more conscious and, let's say, wiser decisions in regards to their food. I believe we should be reducing the amount of food, uh, animal-based proteins in our diet anyway. And I do see that things like uh, plant-based meats or meat substitutes are an option, but they're not the only option. There's so much biodiversity out there that I think we should be supporting that on a local level more than, say, feeding money into large corporations who are growing meat in a lab. Sure. I think I'd like to talk about the demand supply side. I mean, meat industry being the part of, like, our fabric for the past, I mean, 100 years, but then with cold chain in the past 30 years, where the price of meat will become easy access, right? And then because of the meat being easy access, then, then the population can have more protein and more new rich uh, diet so they can like grow and be prosperous as the economy. But now, at, at, at the point where they try to control the meat price, 
not to be exceeding certain like uh, affordability level. So if you talk about meat from animal, once it leaves slaughterhouse and for plant-based meat, leaving the plants, probably cost about the same per kilo. But the downstream process make it different. On the one hand, because the meat in the, in the shield aisle at the supermarket is the, is the magnet for consumer to come in so that they can make smaller margin, so they can make up margin from something else like tissue paper or shampoo. And then they have no VAT for the meat industry. But for plant-based meat, it's like it's a mixture of everything. Then it becomes like VAT in, and by default. And then secondly, it is become frozen because the demand is not there. Where the shelf life of shoe only lasts seven to eight days, right? Otherwise, you have like big return from supermarkets. You have to do frozen. Then frozen, you have to like require so much of the shelf space and shelf energy, where the GP or gross profit margin from the retail up to thirty percent. So that's where the price is different. So if we have demands. If we have the tofu, is not e expensive because the demand for tofu, but for something probably looking look around for like more demand to grow, and then maybe some assistance from the retailer or government could help making this to reach uh, to reach the consumer more efficiently. And then also, I mean, I think you talked about 2050, Smith. At a certain point, it just will be totally untenable for people to continue to eat meat, whether it's something we want to do or not, right? Any other? Yeah, I have a, I'm, uh, my name is uh, Ingo Poole. Um, been kind of like engaged on the energy transformation and on food transformation now for, for quite a while. And I have a comment and a question. Um, actually, the comment is, if you look at it from a dynamic perspective, you know, like the rate of change in energy and food. Uh, we on the energy side, we are going from fossil to renewable. In, p in food, we're going from uh, meat-based to plant-based, kind of like the same thing. In energy, we're talking now about stranded assets. We're talking about that the incumbent that that fossil industry is on the way out, and that there's, if you don't do that transition right, there's a very high cost of basically that infrastructure, that old system that kind of like goes, goes up. And, but there's a lot of people you know, who are invested in that industry, whose pensions depend on it, and governments are already very concerned that if we do that transition wrong, you know, that, um, that that is quite damaging. Now, food is going through the same thing, right? So we're going from uh, this meat-based to plant-based. The difference is that the transition on the food side is 100 times faster than the transition on the energy side. Yeah? So in energy, we, are already we, we will have a problem. Right on food, the transition is so fast because people like it. You know, and I think, why do people change? I actually think it's not about awareness; it's about user experience. It's always about user experience, and I think there is now consensus that plant-based diet, like that, that young generation, and it's getting stronger and stronger. That this is the way to go, and it's happening so fast. But the real question, and I would like your comment on it, is that the incumbents, the dairy industry and the meat industry, are not able to adapt to the new trend fast enough. So look at company valuations on the plant-based side. Look at what happened after the Beyond Meat IPO, right? They went sky high, right? Or like the other big players. Look what happens to dairy. No? They're, already, they're already operating on subsidized business models on super thin margins, right? So just a small, basically, drop on demand basically kills them, and it's already happening. Look at bankruptcies in dairy uh, in Europe. Look at what happens in valuations in meat -based. Basically, energy side, the same thing happened. Now look at the energy utilities. It's literally the same story. Energy is a bit ahead, but it's much slower. And so basically the thing is, what you know, what, like, do you have a comment on like food companies that are in dairy and meat and like their risk of becoming completely stranded and obsolete at a rate that is so fast that they cannot adapt to? And also, just to add on to that, do you see any companies, especially in Thailand, like we see in Europe and the United States, that are starting to transition, that were once maybe poultry companies and then decided they would become protein companies? I think uh, this is the, the survival. I mean, it doesn't say survival, but it's like the, the risking the bets, uh, uh, hedging the bet to the, to the plant-based side. But consumers can feel directly, are you like, believe in your mission or your, your money at the end? of the goals, right? So I think uh, the, the pure play company like Beyond Meat or Impossible will have 
the easy way to communicate that they try to fight against something, and that's where the user experience, the consumer trust issue, or like the brand representation. You want to support a brand that really like you want to to be part of. This is where I think the pure play company will be at the edge for communicating something with without baggage, and this is something where I think. But the logistic and also the the whole equ ecosystem is already been built for the meat industry. Where we ca how can we tap into that and make sure this this trend could could happen and can like collaborate and make sure that it's a world or the future together is not by like one camp or uh, or the other. Um, and in terms of making that transition, to follow up with your question, do you see any um, government? participation in this transition, because we're seeing it from a consumer side, a demand side, but in order to support these dairy companies and meat companies from going bankrupt or being able to transition, I'm assuming that they would need some. I think, I think for the part of government support, I think uh, the one that we participate is called Space Aid Program, where like the National Innovation Agency with Thai Union, with Mahidol University, try to help incubating the food tech company inside Thailand to get equip them with knowledge, which equip us with knowledge and the right connection. This is the program where they can help at least growing the small startups to become like uh, more stronger. And then, but on the part where I feel from the business person, I don't want government to, to come in so closely. Leave it a little bit alone. So I think the innovation will, will, will prosper without like this kind of like policy dominance. Li li leave it a little bit area for the 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 right innovation to prosper by themselves without like otherwise it'll be like the policy or the voter or whatever I don't want to have that picture to be to be interfering with the with the movement of the industry I think a little like that okay I think we have time for just one more question if there's one in the audience. So thank you. Uh, as a representative of our government, I'm the ambassador of Sweden to, to ambassador designate, I should say, to, to Thailand. Uh, I wasn't provoked, but <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment on, on uh, I, f I found it very interesting to listen to, to all of you uh, when you discuss whether or, not the, whether or not the change is fast and fast or slow. I mean, you could, you could, you could look, look upon that question from different angles, I guess. And I'm not a politician. But I'm a bureaucrat, <laughs> and as a bureaucrat, I, I, I still believe that uh, sometimes we should make use of the regulatory or the legislative uh, sort of element. Uh, and I actually think that, fr you know, from the policy level, sometimes also when we discuss these, th these things, uh, you need to have brave politicians, brave lawmakers that is also willing to make some some quite tough decisions uh, when when change is not fast uh, happening fast enough um, that I mean also and not, not without and not with you know not interfering with um, what what you what you <laughs> what you were uh, saying but but I think that one should at least not rule out that uh, sometimes it's needed uh, uh, sometimes it's needed to say we need to say also that this is simply not acceptable we need to ban this and that uh, I'm not saying that we should ban meat, <laughs> uh, at least not tomorrow. But we, we, <laughs> but we need, but we need to keep that option also to 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 work through legislation and and by regulatory means and so on. Thank you. I think we unfortunately need to wrap this up because we're out of time. So I just want to say thank you so much to all of you guys. This has been a really interesting and wonderful discussion. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, USA is here just to build on the dialogue that's been set up by the local Chamber of Commerce. I'm really excited to be invited to work alongside and to bring um, the different actors that we're working with mm -hmm. to this event and to be able to help um, facilitate dialogue, to catalyze investment, green investment in this part of the world, particularly as it relates to the what do we have here at the Yes. So here you see one of our programs, which is called Green Invest Asia, which is looking to really shift the supply chains in this part of the world towards sustainable um, agricultural and land use practices. We recognize that the green investment in this part of the world, the demand far outstrips what public sector actors, such as the U.S. government, can do. And we really need to find and work alongside private sector to be able to meet this need. And so we've been really fortunate to um, identify companies that are thinking long term about what the how they can secure their supply chain mm -hmm. for the future, but also in a way that protects and heals the planet. Coming from USA, Angela, what do you think is the, uh, the key success factor to make sustainability uh, a mainstream? Well, I think as we're hearing today from many of the speakers, sustainability is not uh, in, in um, it is not in conflict with profit. Sustainable practices and profitable practices go together, and smart businesses have identified that and are using that and harnessing that for their capabilities. So that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You say it. Okay. Okay. Now we move to. Uh, Hello. Hello. Oh, Tetra Pak. Tetra Pak, yeah. Yeah, so uh, tell us a bit about your uh, presentation here today. So Tetra Pak is all about protect what's good. We are about protecting and protecting food. So we think that we are doing very well. If you have a problem in one place, like milk, and you want to sell it in a place where you have people, cities, you have to bring it in. And we track it in the most efficient and sustainable way to bring even without refrigeration. So you don't need to refrigerate the fridge. You can bring it it's close to the source, of cows are, and you bring it in the cities. So what's sustainability, uh, uh, what's the role of sustainability in your business? I, I dare to say that sustainability is part of our own We have always, our founders said that the package should save more than its cost. Of course, that's financial, but it was well in the environment. Because mind you, many, a lot of the food, it's, a, it's an estimated to be one third is wasted. And it's wasted because you don't pack it right, not because we do you have to big packs or for many reasons. So we, in a very efficient way, can take all the products and bring it to where it needs to be. So, no waste. And then, what is it most important? Cartons are renewable. 70% of the carton package is paper. And the paper we use is coming for forests that are very well managed, so it's not going to be taken out and then leave it open. It's like growing rice. You have a tree, you grow it, and it's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then you harvest the tree, put a new tree in, and off you go again. And this type of food is used to make the paper. So we are renewable, we avoid waste, and we make food safe, available, like this new Thank you so much. Hi Karen.
kind of selling to local stores, mm -hmm. so we collect them from restaurants as well. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do, and then we bring those surplus to vulnerable communities in Bangkok and Okay, so what are the challenges? Because I, I, I spoke to a couple of hotels and they were really uh, concerned about the, uh, the, the, the safety and the, 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 you know, if there would be a uh, file the, the lawsuit against us if right. something happens to the consumers, right? So how do you deal with these issues? So we acknowledge those risks. And that's why we have an in-house food uh, safety specialist. Uh -huh. So we really carefully select mm -hmm. the food that we bring to the communities. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure we protect the brand of our partners as well. Yes. So it's all about protecting their brands, our brand, and the community as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we do a food donor training with our partners. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that they really understand what surface food that can be donated to us, mm -hmm. and what can we take, and what can we bring to the community. Mm -hmm. So we put that system in place so that mm -hmm. we can ensure that we protect everyone. Yeah. How long have you been doing this? Four years now. How has the uh, uh, outcome been? It's been great. Yeah. You know? The COVID has challenged us deeply uh, when it hit time. Mm -hmm. So all of our partners in the hotel industry mm -hmm. has stopped. Mm -hmm. So we have to really find ways on how to evolve mm -hmm. and adapt to the situation. Mm -hmm. Luckily, the retail industry has mm -hmm. been very supportive. Mm -hmm. They have expanded their operations. Mm -hmm. All of the big names in the retail industry is now yeah. supporting us. They really want to uh, eliminate food waste, mm -hmm. and they really want to support by giving us more food service so we can offer it to more communities. Mm -hmm. how, how would you motivate uh, and other businesses or maybe uh, other people in the industry to actually really consider uh, going green or, or care about sustainability? Right, you know, it's all about um, the circle economy. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that people have access to food. Mm -hmm. Because uh, billions of food are being produced. And the, but at the end of the day, there are billions of people who are hungry mm -hmm. by the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So we really want to encourage all of these companies to really be part of this uh, mission, to eliminate the food waste mm -hmm. and be part of, you know, donate the food to us. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be a financial donation or food donation in order to sustain this operation. Mm -hmm. Because running this operation is not cheap. You know? mm -hmm. We have uh, seven trucks mm -hmm. that runs in, in those cities, mm -hmm. seven days a mm -hmm. uh, So there's fuel costs, there's drivers costs, mm -hmm. everything. So we really want to encourage the, our partners and different companies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to help us sustain this operation. Mm -hmm. so there are more people who are needing some good access. Thank you very much. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we follow. Where? Where? Where next? Here. We're here. Hi. Hi. Okay, and this is? Um, this is uh, SkyPoint. SkyPoint. SkyPoint, yeah. Oh, we yeah. have yeah. A, uh, We have a system that uses tap water and air ah. uh, and turns that into a very strong cleaning and sanitizing How liquid. How is that possible? Um, it's, uh, I, I almost said it was magic, uh, but <laughs> then I learned a lot more about it. And what happens is, we connect this to tap water, uh -huh. and when we switch the machine on, it sucks up air, passes it over ozone generators, and injects it into the water. Uh -huh. uh, the resulting liquid is stronger than most of the commercial cleaning and sanitizing liquids, uh -huh. uh, but it's harmless mm. to, to, to humans. It kills bacteria, mm -hmm. uh, spores, molds, and, uh, and viruses. Mm -hmm. um, but after it's done its work, it turns back into water and air. So in terms of sustainability, uh -huh. there's nothing that can beat it. Yeah. Um, we want to actually replace all of these horrible chemical contaminants uh -huh. uh -huh. and turn it, uh, replace those with, uh, with our machine. Uh, because sustainability-wise, if all these chemicals don't go into the environment anymore, mm. it's just so much better for everyone. Mm. What are the challenges of convincing people not to use you know, what they used to? Um, it's a new technology, so it comes down to uh, showing it, uh, doing a lot of demonstrations, uh -huh. and the most common uh, 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 comment that we get once we do a demonstration is, it's a no-brainer, uh -huh. and it's a game-changer. Uh -huh. It's going to change the whole industry. Uh, it's like the horse and carriage versus the car. Uh -huh. uh, but we're under Tesla then. All right. <laughs>
has it been already uh, uh, exposed to Thai uh, audience? Yes, or, or uh, we've uh, we've already sold uh, for several uh, companies. Uh -huh. One of the seafood companies is already using this uh, to clean the, the seafood when it comes in and before it goes out. Uh -huh. They've had a 90% reduction in wastage and returns. Uh, hotels are using it as well uh -huh. uh, to clean and to sanitize uh, uh, the spaces. Uh, restaurants were hoping to go into schools uh -huh. and hospitals uh -huh. uh, to just have a much higher level of cleaning yeah. and save them a lot of money yeah. because operationally our system is about 200 times cheaper uh -huh. to use than chemicals. Mm. Wow. Do we have a little demonstration? Uh, yes, one second. I'll just uh, yeah. switch it on. So that's just the water? This is just uh, water. Yeah. Right. So we switch it on. Yeah. And then uh, now we're making APS ozone immediately. Yeah. And I'll switch it off now. Yeah. So this liquid is stronger than anything uh, commercially That's done already. It's done already. Okay. If you smell it, it, it smells like there's an after a thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very uh, yeah. non-chemical kind of smell. Correct. So, yeah. Uh, this, yeah. Yeah, exactly. This can clean windows, mirrors, bathrooms, floors, even carpets. Uh -huh. um, and uh, it's used in dentistry to clean the mouth during operations. Okay. Uh, it's used in uh, to, to clean food in kitchens, uh -huh. um, and also commercial commercial uh, food production areas. Mm. There's no need for chlorine anymore mm. uh, because most of the food is washed in chlorine, uh -huh. and that's not necessary anymore. We can use this, which is super sustainable uh -huh. and very healthy. Mm -hmm. Because um, one of the things that I normally do is I oh, you drink it. It's drinkable. It is that same. All right. I don't Absolutely. recommend using this, or doing that a lot, because it kills good and bad bacteria. Oh, okay. But for a demonstration purpose, just to show how it's safe. Uh, safe it is, also for staff, mm -hmm. uh, this is the future. All right. Well, I wish you all the best. Okay, thank you very much. Thank for your you time. so much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Fantastic.
is uh, delivering solar power parts that we offer in the rest of the we operate on the, on the rooftop mainly of our clients. Our clients tend to be large industrial customers uh, like Michelin, uh, like Gold, Aluminium, uh, SIG. Um, and, and what we want to achieve is that uh, we help them achieve their sustainability goals while at the same time um, focusing on their so business and delivering their business goals. This has been around for, for a while, the concept of solar energy, uh, but, but uh, is it already a mainstream in, in, in Thailand and in the region, or do you still have a long way to go to the region to, 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 uh, to switch to uh, clean energy? Yeah. Actually, today, really not anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is a mainstream energy resource. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, I mean, first of all, many people still look at it as a new technology. Actually, the modern solar cell was invented in the 1950s, and so older than me, certainly, the viewers got older measures. Um, and, and secondly, uh, that uh, last year, um, solar power actually was the largest power generation resource by generation deployed worldwide, um, and the cheapest. So today, really, there's no reason anymore. If you are building a uh, factory owner in Thailand and you do not have solar on your roof, you are losing money every day and your emissions are higher than emission. So much. You're welcome. We show all that in the uh, well, first of all, let me thank you, the organizers, uh, for allowing us to be here. Uh, we are very happy. Yeah, we are very happy to be here. Uh, Farber Flags is a company that has been in the printing business for over 25 years, um, and since 10 years, it's been time. The main products that we produce is called soft signage, we mean anything printed on fabric mm -hmm. uh, that is used for branding for advertising. Okay. The reason why we are here is that since a couple of years we also have these materials in recycled version. Okay. So anything that you can see here on the table, these flags, these light bulbs, these table flags, everything is everything is recycled, uh, made from uh, pet bottles. So, pet bottles. So all of these items here, in the previous life, they were plastic bottles. Uh -huh. um, so we are having this uh, available in Thailand. Yeah. It is not widely known. In Europe, people are asking for this kind of products. In this part of the world, people are not asking for it. Yeah. We are pushing it into the market. Yeah. And in general, these recycled versions of polyester fabrics uh -huh. are a bit uh, more expensive than uh, what we call virgin polyester products. Mm -hmm. But as a company, the effort that we make is we operate at the same prices as the virgin polyester products. Yeah. So any company interested in making their... We the of scale. We need a large amount of uh, yes. uh, And any, any company that is interested to make their marketing activities a bit more sustainable, uh -huh. we can help you with that. How would you convince them to, to, to switch to a uh, more greener uh, product? Thank you very much. What's your sales pitch and how would you convince them? Um, well, it's one, one of the items that we focus on is uh, oceans and ocean pollution. Mm -hmm. So uh, many of the bottles that we use on these plastic bags, they end up in the oceans. Now, when we recycle bottles and use it as use the fabric to make bags, then for every square meter of flag that we produce, one of our bottles are recycled. So for any flag that you order, it's at least five bottles. Yes, that's a big portion of our business. That's what you need to be to our business. And all our application as well. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. 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 Hi, what do we have to offer today? Uh, okay, basically what we are doing is that we have several solutions. Yeah. Because our, our company is focusing on zero waste okay. and more in circular economy equation. Uh -huh. So we, we have our customers solving waste problem. Uh -huh. Okay, so what you see here, this is the first one that we are having. So this is the logo that we have. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, as you can see from here, we are looking at the same set, 90% less. So what, how? Let me ask you a question. So, I mean, we, okay, wait, do you know 
when you open your faucet and head, how many liters of water that is going from the faucet per minute? Per minute? Per minute. One or two liters? No. At least nine liters. Seriously? Yeah. Okay, one minute. Yeah. So this is the logo that we have. Let's see. I have a little here, one liter. Okay. Go at the If you can wash your hand, with this, why don't you have to waste this? This is not exactly. yeah. So, so this, this is one of the sustainable solutions that we provide for us. Okay. So you can see, okay, this is very <laughs> so, so you can see the difference. Ah, okay. So we are talking about at least 25% water saving. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's one solution. Yes, this, this on water, yeah. or water cleaning. Yeah. And this is what we have. This will be very interesting yeah. because we have a composting machine mm -hmm. that will turn your food waste within 24 hours into soil. Oh. Yeah. And then you can also use this one. You can After exactly use organic fertilizer. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm. Is it okay. Yes, this is for food waste. After 24 hours. We have a machine. Yes, we have a machine. Are this for household or for uh, For now, we are, we are looking at commercial. Okay. Because the minimum size that we have is 60 meters. Okay, but even at the restaurant, even if you have 5 meters, Five liters per household. Please. <laughs> I think eventually, from our, our perspective, I think that food waste composting machine will be like a TV. That's the vision. Make it happen. Yep. Okay, so for it. <laughs> okay, and then okay. the third one that we have is. So this this is the product. Oh, the yeah. <coughs> so this we have been doing this product for the past eight years in the market. Okay. So this is the one that we have a lot of kitchen solving the grease problem. Uh -huh. The grease problem, your pipe clogging, your uh, cooker just problem, smell problem. Mm. So it's non chemical, it's completely biological. <laughs> so we, we kind of compose that side. So we decompose the waste in your waste pipe into water and gas within two days. Okay. So when it's released from your household, it's already <laughs> yep. environmentally friendly. Yes, we help expedite so the treatment process. I see. Speed the grace. Like the name. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds delicious. <laughs> you should try. Oh, no. Our product is safe, don't worry. Because we have, we have a certification for the safety. Alright. So it's safe too. Hey, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we have about 30 minutes uh, to have a conversation. Um, we will talk a bit about some of the incentives and drivers, reflective in trends around consumers, climate change, um, maybe some other things that they don't know about yet. Uh, I'll let them each have about five minutes to start, just to give you a little bit of um, their work in their words. Uh, and then we'll have about 10 minutes or so between us just to bounce back a few questions and ideas. And then I definitely want to open it up to you here in the room and those of you online to ask them some questions. This is a great opportunity um, to dig a little deeper and ask these two very approachable guys um, what they're doing and why. Okay? So I'm going to turn it over to Walter Wutler to start. Uh, you can, oh, that's me. There you are. And uh, click one more. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to all. Um, thanks for the nice picture, by the way. It was pre-COVID picture, a um, long, long time ago. So for those who are not aware of the, the Nescafe plan, the Nescafe plan was launched in uh, 2010 um, to, to, acceler to accelerate and um, increase uh, the scope of activities we were doing already in many origins. Uh, first coffee agri-service uh, department was actually opened in the Philippines in the 1960s and then we had Thailand, for example, in the 80s. And um, it's, a, it's a global coffee sustainability program. Uh, it's one of the largest one uh, in terms of um, responsible sourcing volume, in terms of plantlet distribution and uh, farmers um, reach. Uh, yeah, we have several pillars which are actually contributing. We have uh, plant science uh, linked to with breeding, uh, looking at uh, drought tolerance material, um, rust tolerance material. Uh, we have um, plant propagation and distribution, and we have uh, agricultural environmental research. 
looking at regenerative agriculture, um, compliance, then we have also then the climate changes coming in and carbon mitigation. And then we have training, and it's not only training, I think it's going beyond training, it's about coaching and technical assistance, ensuring adoption, also there, uh, looking at crop diversification, uh, regenerative agriculture, uh, farm economics is very important. And then we have um, community uh, programs, um, empowerment of co-ops, organizations, uh, gender and youth empowerment, um, and then water and biodiversity. If you look at our whole supply chain, value chain, we have about uh, one million uh, farmers partners um, gl globally. As part of, uh, if you look at our sourcing, we are sourcing to two channels. Uh, one is through uh, trade partners, and uh, another channel is called uh, direct procurement of Farmer Connect, and in which we have a, this scheme we have in uh, countries where we also have a local manufacturing. For example, like in Thailand, we have local to local supply, and we have a much more closer linkage and supply chain with the farmers directly. Um, then we will uh, be reaching about uh, two trainings, about 100,000 farmers through this supply chain, this Farmer Connect supply chain. Uh, we are distributing plantlets uh, globally. In these 10 years, we have distributed 230 million improved plantlets. Um, these plantlets are, and that's very important, it's for renovation, it is not for uh, increasing area, but it's for renovation of old material. In many countries, uh, there is actually a, a lack of quality material to replace the old material which they have. And in some countries, uh, for example, India, where you have still uh, coffee trees which are 100 years old and still producing, uh, but there is also uh, an age on that one. Uh, so I think providing access to new material is, is key also for uh, ensuring supply on the longer term. Uh, this year we will reach 70% of uh, responsible sourcing, working towards 100% uh, uh, the coming years. Um, we know that the last 10, 10% will be the, the most difficult ones to, to close the gap, but uh, that's the ambition. Um, and then we have a lot of uh, partnerships with other organizations and trade partners on, on uh, initiatives in the supply chain. And uh, our, our initiatives are also, um, we have uh, M&E campaigns through third party, which is Rainforest Alliance, which is having annual campaigns in our origins to see uh, and check if our work has impact and is efficient. All right, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so all the colors have changed. Um, so I'm with uh, Harmless Harvest. Harmless Harvest is the, is the leader of the premium coconut water uh, in the US. Uh, we sell exclusively in America. Uh, the Nam Hom coconut, so the fragrant coconut uh, that you can find west from Bangkok, mostly uh, here in Thailand. Uh, the company was founded uh, 10 years ago. And seven years ago, uh, we uh, started our own factory here. Um, and since you mentioned I was in San Francisco before, I came here to uh, build up the sourcing uh, and the sustainable sourcing with, uh, with the farmers here. We are a very different scale. Uh, we have uh, today 400 farmers in our program. Uh, and uh, we've been organic since the beginning. And in 2014, we started working on fair trade. Um, and since, uh, since a few days ago, we passed 20,000 beneficiaries of our fair trade program, which is uh, every time we buy coconuts, we put some money in a fund that's used for uh, community reach out, and we focus mostly on uh, healthcare and education. Um, so this was all embedded uh, since the beginning in our DNA. Uh, the, 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 the company always had th that vision to do something good for the planet, good for people, uh, as well as a, a very good and tasty product, uh, and trying to bring all this together. Because of the scale, uh, we are learning to do a little more every time and transitioning from just being organic to being organic and fair trade to uh, look very, very closely at our carbon emission and uh, regenerative, regenerative organic.
All right, just uh, to talk a little bit about uh, regeneration and regenerative farming. Um, we're the, the, the topic today is food of the future. And when we look at our supply chain, we are increasingly suffering, and our farmers are incre increasingly suffering from uh, global warming. Uh, we're seeing uh, since November 2018, Thailand has been in the heaviest drought in 40 years. Uh, we are lacking water uh, badly, and this is a, a global phenomenon. But when we look at our own um, at, at our own supply chain at our farm, the traditional farming model for coconut in Thailand, for that Nam Hom, uh, it's monocrop, it's high density, uh, and there is no soil cover. So the, the results of all that is we are witnessing uh, a very heavy soil erosion. And for a farmer, his first asset is, is topsoil, right? This is where he can grow his food. And, and we're, we are seeing, because of that canal distribution, you have water everywhere in the farm, if they don't have any uh, soil cover, every time you have heavy rain, the soil goes to the canal. When they have too much water, they pump it out to the public canal, and it, end up, it ends up in the sea. And that's where we find all the sediment. Um, the other thing is that you have little rain, but you can still harvest it. If your soil is very good quality soil, uh, the water is going to come inside, go inside, uh, penetrate it, and, and you're going to retain it. So when you have bad years, heavy drought, the, the plant can still grow and thrive. What's happening is that right now the soil is compacted. They've lost a lot of, of their top sediment, and so they, they can't even retain it. So they have to water it. They have additional costs also coming from that. And we're seeing a um, higher level of uh, pest and disease. We're seeing um, lower yield. Um, last year, we, we, we saw a, a drop of 30% in farm yield, which is very significant. Um, and um, uh, the coconuts are also smaller. Uh, much smaller uh, coconut than we used to have before. When you sell coconuts, not necessarily a problem, but we are selling coconut water, so we buy what's inside. So when the coconut is very small, that's also a big challenge. And the last challenge it's, it, that, that it brings is um, planification. We have a, a factory, we have hundreds of workers, but the, seasons, the seasonal patterns are disrupted. Uh, this year, the, the low season started two months before, a month and a half, sorry, before uh, the usual pattern. Uh, but another year, it can be uh, coming later. So you don't have your, your staff or your packaging is not ready. You need to hire people in a rush. Like all these things come as a real challenge for, for a company, uh, our size or our, our bigger size. Next, please. So it, it, this is a global phenomenon. And for or those of you who have been uh, researching on that, uh, we've lost in the last 40 years a third of our agricultural farmland uh, around the world. And we're, it's not over. We keep losing the equivalent of the size of England in topsoil every year. And at this space, in, in 60 years, we are going to run out of harvest. We have 60 harvest left, seasons left to harvest products, according to the UN. So that's a very significant issue that we need to address. If we talk about food of the future, it's not necessarily how we're going to grow it. It's first starting to look at uh, the root cause and how we can fix that uh, on the base. And on the other side, you have our consumers. Our consumers are demanding, and, and I heard uh, the, the, the previous panel was mentioning that a lot. Um, the consumers are demanding that change. And uh, Gen Z and millennials are um, ready to pay more uh, to pay at least 10% more to acquire sustainable goods. They, the, the growth, half of the growth over the last five years in CPG in the US was coming from sustainable products. And, and this is a global phenomenon. So this is uh, overwhelming. Uh, when I look at climate change as, a, as an individual, I, I feel I can't do anything and it, it's too late and, and, and we are somehow doomed and all the communication has been very somehow demotivating or, or, or negative. Um, and go to the next one, please. Um, that's where regenerative uh, agriculture comes uh, as a real uh, game changer. Uh, some people have been working on that for decades, but it's, it's becoming more and more uh, uh, mainstream uh, since uh, two or three years ago. Um, and, and the whole purpose of that is to say, we have when, with that erosion, the soil has emitted carbon at a much faster rate than our industrial activities. If we are able to rebuild that topsoil through human intervention, we can fix carbon back into the soil at a very fast pace. And it's estimated that 
by the end of our lifetime, we can have reverted climate change. If we are able to work very closely with our farmers to bring compost, uh, plant cover crops, bring biodiversity back into our farms, um, reduce monocropping to, to, to have diverse crop uh, in our farms, we will be able to uh, cool down the planet and stop that uh, pace, uh, that, that, um, that trend that we have uh, that's leading us to four degrees uh, at least increase by the end of the century. So it, it's still time to, to change that. So um, our vision is to really focus now on, on those two things because if we keep doing organic, organic is great for, for, for food quality because you don't put chemical in your food. Uh, but it doesn't mean your farm is healthy and it doesn't mean your plant is healthy. Uh, it, you, you can grow uh, organic food on a very depleted soil with low nutrients. And so we are, that's why we're, we're looking uh, very deeply now at engaging our farmers on that transition to regenerative organic. And we have planned to do that by 2025. And the last part is uh, carbon emission. Uh, so we've been working with uh, USAID and Christy on um, doing our first assessment, which is a big step for a company our size, to look at uh, what's the status today, where are our hotspots, uh, what's the situation of our farms, how can we improve that, uh, to, uh, and, and, and we have the goal to be positive uh, by 2025. Thanks, Matthew. Okay. Um, so I want to turn a little bit to Wuchuk. I mean, you guys, one thing I think is very interesting is we have a very large company and a, and a smaller company, um, but you have a similar model in the sense of relying on smallholders, and smallholders are such an important part of your supply chain. Um, Matthew mentioned a couple of things that are challenging him um, in Harmless Harvest in relation to working with their smallholders and, and their supply chain, you know, around uh, farm education, climate change, kind of, kind of getting some of these strategies into place. Could you talk a little bit um, from your perspective at Nestle um, about some of the challenges um, and kind of how you're working with smallholders to execute your sustainable strategy vision for Nescafe? So worldwide, most of the coffee is actually produced by small holdings, uh, except for Brazil, where we have some large estates, but otherwise it's really working with, with small holders. Uh, Small holdings uh, that mean less than three hectare. In some origins, in, in, in Africa, for example, uh, we are not speaking about hectare, we're speaking about number of coffee trees. So it's, 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 very, it's very challenging, uh, and you have to work with, with really m many farmers. On top of that, we have an aging farming community, uh, which is make also much more complex, as young generation is not willing anymore to, to take over the farm or to invest in the farm. Um, another challenge what we, we actually see and is um, there is a lot of training. Um, we provide a lot of training, a lot of other companies are providing training, but it's about uh, convincing the farmers also to adopt this new technology, uh, adopt these new practices. And I heard also the previous session, it's about uh, having a, a business case for these farmers. It's about convincing the farmers by, by doing these new practices uh, that you will be able to increase productivity, um, that uh, you will also improve farm economics, uh, being more resilient. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I think that's, 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 that's really important, but it's not, it's not easy. Uh, and I'm sure I have the same, same experiences. And then just to follow up a little bit, because again, like it is important about the profitability and the financial incentives. Um, and I think you both, if I may say this, are looking at strategies like intercropping and thinking about ways in which um, that can be integrated into your supply chain uh, or into their farmer landscapes um, to help kind of push that along. But that there's also some climate benefits to that. Um, so I'm going to stay with you just for another minute, Wouter, and because uh, Matthew talked a little bit about the impact and the importance around climate change and, and carbon emissions and kind of trying to figure that out. Where is Nestle on kind of that thinking around that kind of aspect of a criteria in thinking about your models going forward, kind of understanding the carbon footprint of your farmers um, and how that will impact your decisions um, around sourcing, sourcing strategies uh, and, and kind of inputs and, and expectations with your farmers? So climate will have a huge impact on uh, the supply chain. Um, millions of farmers will be affected. And we can already see it today, where we see that Robusta is growing more in altitude, Arabica is pushing even further. Uh, so it, it will have a big, big impact. Uh, so we're focusing a lot now on, on, on regenerative agriculture, going back to this uh, agroforestry models or uh, intercropping models. Uh, which actually in many countries you have it by, by default, but it's not really um, 
planned and organized. Uh, so also there, uh, a lot of efforts is needed. Actually, before the 1970s, a lot of research was done on intercropping. That was the way of agriculture. After 1970s, it was all on speci specialization, uh, and very little research was done anymore on the agroforestry intercropping models. Um, also there, we are, we are working with partners. We are trying to have standardized uh, models in place. Uh, we are exploring to have the cool farm tool, for example, for perennial crop, so that we can have the data um, uh, available. Because there is a lot, a lot of data available, but also there I see there is a lot of um, data that is not very accurate, uh, contradicting each other. Um, so we still need to learn a, a lot. Okay. At, at farmer level, I think farmers um, start to, to see the benefits of going back to this uh, intercropping agroforestry models. Uh, we diversify income, we spreading the risks also. Um, but it's also looking at, 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 at myself, for example, is a, is a change of mindset. Um, we are coffee agronomists. Uh, we have been always focusing on coffee, and now it's about saying to the, to the agronomist who's working in the field of the farmer, please do not look at the coffee, but look at the farm, and try to work with the farmer on the whole, on the whole farm. And is that coffee and coconut, or coffee and cacao, or coffee and pepper? Well, you need to make sure that you know also uh, how to, to manage these other crops and to organize, organize the farm. Thanks. Any of that resonating with you, Matthew? Oh, everything he's been saying is resonating. Um, we have exactly the same challenging, and I'm not going to go back on, uh, on the, the challenge for the farmers. And But we have to demonstrate a, a, an economic model with intercropping and, and uh, diverse uh, diversification that's going to work for the farmers. Uh, and, and yeah, there's definitely a lack of research on, on how to do that. But the main challenge, I think this will be the easy part. Um, I, I think the real challenge will be the supply chain around that. So if you go to Ratchaburi today to uh, get coconuts, you have thousands of people working in that industry, from the harvesters to the truck drivers, to the collection centers, to the transporters, to the, the, the manufacturing uh, uh, piece. Uh, everybody's working and organized around that. If tomorrow um, we tell them, OK, you're going to do yeah, coffee and, and coconut and all this, we, we will need to partner. There is no company that can uh, tell them, you're going to do that, 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 and I buy everything. So we're going to have to find um, uh, ways uh, to, to identify companies that can complement our demand uh, so that we can offer outlets to the farmers and, gener uh, and literally generate value for them. It's, it's better from all aspects for the farmers. It's better for the planet. They will be more resilient. They will have different streams of revenue. When coconut market price goes down, something else is going to go up, etc. But how do I, tomorrow, if I tell them to, to plant uh, coffee and guava and papaya, who's going to buy it? And uh, like identifying those people is going to be the main challenge. It, it requires a major change in the way uh, agri-food companies are approaching the business. And, and I don't think anyone has a solve on that yet. OK. I have a lot more questions, but I am also cognizant of time. And we have quite a full house here. Um, and I want to give it people a chance in the audience or online who might have any questions um, for Matthew or Wouter. Great, right up here in the front. Can you just also introduce yourself uh, when yeah. you? So I'm John Louis. I'm in the chocolate business. I've been in Thailand for 27 years. And um, yeah, I, I hear the problems you're facing, and they're very similar to what I'm facing. <laughs> so 15 years ago, I tried to start cocoa business here in Thailand, and I actually modeled it on some of Nestle's uh, success stories here with contract farming, and it failed because it was a monopoly. Uh, of cocoa in that time. This company, since that time, has been taken over by a multinational who decided to close the factory in Thailand, and all the farmers are left there with cocoa, which they don't know what to do, so they started cutting trees. Now there's a fashion in Thailand about chocolate, and you see a lot of uh, bean to bar happening, and a lot of cocoa trees coming. And I was uh, just last month talking to Kasitsa University with some, some officers of the different horticultural centers and warning them that you're going to have a major economical crash in the cocoa business in Thailand because people believe that they can sell cocoa at unrealistically high prices, whereas the local market, and, and that's actually the subject that I want to ask you, 
the, the real international market is quite soft on cocoa right now. It's about, I don't know, 70 baht a kilo, I think, plus minus 5 baht. And here they're trying to sell 300 to 500 baht a kilo because people are selling to them the dream that, yeah, you can make so much money per hectare with cocoa, and it's not going to happen. And so the farmers are being actually convinced to plant cocoa, but the government is not creating any infrastructure. So nobody's going to buy this cocoa. And they're planting, I don't know, 300,000 trees, I think, this year alone. And who's going to buy them? So what I see also is I just wa I was in Sakao to talk to some farmers. And I realized that they've been sold dreams by middlemen and by some corporations who are trying. But when it comes down to the, the market price, to actually buying back the cocoa from them, it's not going to happen. And if it happens at 70 baht a kilo, is it sustainable? And that's a problem, because when you buy cocoa at 70 baht a kilo for dried fermented beans, or coffee, I don't know the price of coffee, I'm sorry. But when you see a, a tablet of chocolate on, on the supermarket shelf, or in a gourmet chocolate, I do gourmet chocolate, the margins are so high. So there needs to be a rebalancing. Because what we see in cocoa is that actually the farmers don't want to plant anymore. Worldwide, we are seeing some, some threats for cocoa because the farmers are getting older. The young generation don't want to work so hard for so little money because they've seen their parents basically go straight into a war, bankruptcy, very often losing their land title deeds to middlemen. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not sustainable. So I think if we don't fix that first, then, yeah, we can talk about regenerating, uh, you know, regenerative uh, agriculture and everything, but the farmers are just not going to do it. So I'd like to know what's the approach on, on a big company, for example, for, for Nestle. How do you deal with that? Because I feel that's a much more imminent threat than, than 2050. I see that in the next 10 years that we will have real problem sourcing quality agricultural and sustainable agriculture because the farmers just don't make enough money anymore. So, so I guess the question is, you know, the, the impact of market dynamics um, on your ability to execute your um, sustain your, your sourcing goals, um, kind of how do you adjust for that or what kind of what, how are you thinking about that for your specific commodities, knowing that you're not? Well, um, Coffee, coffee situation is a little bit different in, in Thailand. First of all, I, I agree with you that Thai, uh, the Thai commodity prices are completely disconnected with the world market prices. Uh, in coffee, you have, you have the same. Okay. Uh, but in Thailand, uh, the, the government has uh, set minimum prices for coffee. Uh, it's a fixed uh, guarantee price. Uh, so it's actually a, a very secure investment for a farmer. He, he knows what he will get uh, minimum uh, of what, depending on what he produces. On the other hand, there is a, there's a shortage of coffee in Thailand. Uh, I, I, probably in cacao is different. I don't know the situation. But in Thailand, uh, there's not enough coffee. Uh, uh, it's, it's a high competition uh, to, to get the coffee. And uh, also, there is a system of uh, quota where uh, so you have to buy locally uh, and then you get an import quota uh, to cover uh, uh, the balance so um, if I if I look at, at the, the business model it's uh, it's a it's a very secure uh, model for the farmers um, which is unique in the world uh, I mean, it's really for Thai the reality also is that uh, we have another crop uh, in the south, which is even much more profitable than coffee, and that is durian. And uh, I was thinking that durian prices would go down with the COVID situation, as most of the durian is actually going to China. Uh, but this is not the case. Uh, and the durian prices remain very high, and, and this is a very, uh, uh, farmers are really investing and planting a lot of, of durian. Uh, which I see in the long term as a risk, uh, as um, coffee is a global commodity. Uh, coffee consumption is increasing year by year. Coffee production is not increasing year by year. Um, we don't know when, but there will be a deficit, uh, if you look at that for the moment, that is coming. Uh, meanwhile, durian is uh, it's a Chinese market. 
and if the Chinese market is uh, going down, it will have a huge impact. And we see, uh, we see it planting uh, all over the region. Um, so we have, we have some ch challenges there, yes. On the other hand, we can see that, for example, uh, if you have a good business case, coming back to, to looking at the, the coffee side, if you have a good business case, if you are able to, pro, uh, to have the farmers, if you have good planting material, uh, you diversify with other crops uh, which have a market, uh, you are able to have a, a good productivity, farmers are adopting, uh, then uh, you can have a, a, a coffee is a good, is a good uh, investment. Uh, we see that in, in Vietnam where farmers are producing up to five ton per hectare, even to six ton per hectare. Uh, and yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a different uh, ag agriculture, yeah. Matthew, do you have anything to add? Just no, I mean, we're we're, seeing, we're yeah. seeing the same the same thing on the coconut, not 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 the the, the risk of price collapsing, but we have that um, uh, he very heavy Chinese demand that's uh, pushing people to plant more and more quantities. Um, what what's happening is that you have uh, it, it's not balancing when it happens. So suddenly people will will plant massively because prices are high, um, and then um, they have a high cost of entry because the plantlets or the seedlings are going to cost. Uh, a lot, and then three years later, the price goes down because there are too many coconuts on the market. But they are overall successful because the trend of the market is, is going up at a very steady pace. Um, so they are not they are not suffering uh, so much about about that. Um, do we have time for another question? At least, yeah. So, is there another another question? Yeah. And if I just try and keep it as a uh, question and. Okay. So kind of what are the differences between um, working, I mean, I think this is particularly maybe relevant for you, maybe, you know, working in the region, what models are replicable um, across countries? Well, if you look at coffee, then we can see that uh, Vietnam, also China, um, coffee growing is a business. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, it's, uh, it's, a, it's the cash crop. Um, um, if it would be not profitable, they would grow another crop. Okay, it's it's an investment they do. It has to be profitable, uh, and it's and they they grow it as, as a really uh, manage it as a business. Uh, in, in in many Southeast Asia countries and also in in, in African origins, um, a lot of agriculture is it's more an, an extensive way. Uh, we have um, sometimes in some origins, uh, coffee growing is done organic by default. Uh, very low inputs, very low management. Um, uh, for example, we have Myanmar, uh, where we have coffee production with productivity levels around uh, 100 kg per hectare. Um, then it's getting very difficult, uh, but of course, the inputs are, are very low. Um, so so there's, there's a lot of opportunity to optimize land usage, uh, to have more organized systems in place. Um, but the challenges, uh, which I have mentioned, is um, the young generation is not interested anymore. Um, we, we are with an, a generation that is 50 years above uh, average in, in, in coffee farming. Uh, if there's no succession, they're also not willing to, to, um, to invest. Uh, often you get a reply, yes, but my, my parents did it like this. Why should I change? Um, so. Yeah, there are a lot of, of, of challenges uh, there, but if you are able to have the relationship, if you are able to convince them to change, uh, we can have a, a huge uh, impact uh, on, on the livelihoods and communities. So I think our time is about up, but I, I hear a lot about challenges in the room, and I'm, I'm an optimist. Uh, and so I kind of just very quick, kind of your last, last thought on, you know, yes, you're faced with these challenges, but you're on this journey for a reason. So what What's, what are you optimistic about? What do you see as like why you're doing this and what drives you to keep going? Um, cooling down the planet. Uh, that's pretty pretty clear. Um, my son is one year, uh, one year old. Um, I want to give a 
leave a, a better planet that I found uh, after me. And uh, everything was pretty depressing, reading the news and uh, everything about what's happening in farming uh, and for the planet. And having uh, something that we can all uh, take care of. Uh, everyone is, uh, in the room may not be involved in agriculture, but we're all consumers. We vote every time we, we buy a product. And uh, this is, uh, we, are, we can all be activists to, to um, engage that transformation. So that's, that's what keeps me uh, extremely motivated and, and why we, we put that at the core of uh, our work here in Thailand. Well, similar, improving livelihoods. Uh, I, I worked 10 years in China. Uh, with coffee communities directly, uh, I saw I saw what we could uh, offer and what change we could provide in the communities, uh, getting farmers out of poverty. Uh, I think um, agriculture uh, will continue to play an important role. Uh, it will be even more important now with the climate change and the carbon. And maybe also people from uh, uh, the cities will start also to appreciate what growers are doing every day. Because uh, maybe to highlight, I know everybody sees the, the nice coffee uh, which was prepared, and this was prepared in five, ten minutes. But uh, nobody uh, is actually seeing what all the work has been done behind that to get your nice coffee cup on the table. And this is not five, ten minutes. Huh? This is uh, some uh, it's generations or it's years, actually, uh, also to get this kind of cup of coffee. So the barista is nice to see. And uh, he's giving a nice show, but the real work, I can tell you, is done behind that. Great. Well, thank you both very much. Thank you all for joining us. A round of applause. Everyone, so um, I'd like to first introduce myself, and uh, maybe Juliet can introduce herself afterwards. So I'm from Thai Union. We are a global seafood uh, leader company based here in Bangkok, um, but we have presence worldwide. Um, about um, 44,000 workers, employees worldwide. Um, I'm director of sustainability for Asia and also human rights manager of Thai Union. Thank you. So I'm Juliette Alemani. I work uh, at the company Ferragoa Asia. Uh, we're a consultancy company and we're also some um, technology providers. We work in the food supply chains, specifically with producers. Uh, we help, uh, help them to achieve um, higher standards for social and environmental areas. Thank you. So, um, just to be clear, uh, we partner on this and in the area of uh, aquaculture, shrimp farms. But uh, before we look into what we do together, I want to provide a quick uh, kind of um, explanation about what Thai Union does for sustainability and we, how we apply technologies for sustainability in the past. Okay, so um, Thai Union um, has introduced a sustainability strategy back in around the end of 2015-16, uh, 16, and we call it Sea Change, Changing Seafood for Good. So um, we want to be industry leaders in terms of making sure that our operation and supply chains are sustainable, but also to transform and make sure that the global seafood industry also uh, move in uh, better directions. So um, the overarching objective of sea chains, there are three folds. So one is about the sea, because clearly if the sea oceans are not sustainable, there's not going to be seafood business. So that's clear. Um, secondly, on human and labor rights, the workers that we employ for our factories and also those who work in our supply chain um, have to be safely and um, have to be safe, um, legally employed in power. So things like forced labor and child labor um, have no places in our factories and supply chain. Thirdly, um, kind of overall big picture, because we have a uh, food business, um, so we have crucial roles in terms of provide um, healthy diets to populations. 
and I think the last session mentioned a little bit about climate change. So that clearly has an impact on ocean as well. So the ocean becomes more acidic, becomes warmer, uh, etc. And that could affect fish populations and biodiversities. Um, and based on those objectives, uh, we um, have four pillars on that. So safe and legal labor, uh, responsible sourcing, so issues around IUU fishery, responsible aquaculture, fits right into that. And third one, it's about minimizing environmental impact from our own factories. Things like reducing greenhouse gas, reducing use of water, um, responsible packaging. And lastly, people and communities, that's a traditional CSR where we support um, our workers who live in the same communities or people um, surrounding um, our factories and where we source. Um, and based on those, uh, we got the Dow Jones Sustainability Index uh, ranking first for two years in a row in 2018 and 19 for food categories. And on the right, um, also there's a citrus stewardship business, um, index that looks into how um, different global seafood companies around the world contribute to the SDGs. So that was launched last year and we came up um, on number one on that um, benchmark exercise. Um, now talking about responsible sourcing, um, if you don't look at aquaculture, if you look at the wild caught, our tuna, right? Um, people demand sustainable source of seafood, um, but as you know, sometimes those sustainable source of seafood needs time. The fishery needs time and need technical expertise to develop themselves to the standards. So in the case of ocean, we use the Marine Stewardship Council um, standards. Um, and we don't, as the processors, we don't own fleets, we don't work we don't, you know, work directly with fisheries, but we support our suppliers to achieve those MSC standards through the fishery improvement projects, as you can see on the screen. Um, so, you know, uh, many tuna species in different oceans around the world, different fishing gear types, so we support them um, so that one day they can achieve MSC status. Um, now, talking a little bit uh, before transition to Juliet, um, um, talking about technologies in the oceans, you know, you have things like our pilot projects to apply technologies on fishing vessels. Picture on the left, um, someone installing some equipment there. That's a pilot project uh, we did a few years ago where we install um, satellite connectivity on some pilot um, Thai fishing vessels. Um, as a result of that, um, people on board, the fishing vessels, um, the crew, the captains, um, have access to worker voice. They can call their families, they can call NGOs if they need help, um, you know, when they are in the sea. At the same time, we piloted uh, digital traceability. So you have um, fishing, um, the, the boat captains, who can um, enter information about their catch uh, right on the boats. Um, so that would enhance digital traceability. Um, on the right, that's another project. Um, as you can see from previous slide, we work around the world on fishery improvement projects. And one of the things we do is to help suppliers install what we call electronic monitoring tools. Um, it's basically a special tools that you kind of install on the boat and that, um, so that's something like you have CCTV and that's linked to, um, to the cargo hall, like the area you where you store fish. So when um, there's fishing activity and you want to store the fish, so that kind of trigger the working of the CCTV. And then um, based on that, um, you know, you can see the pictures of the catch uh, going to the cargo. Um, and people can analyze, analyze that and look at that, uh, for example, to look at, you know, what, farm, uh, what the fishermen's report as their catches versus what is captured in the CCTV. So we're looking to work with some university to uh, apply maybe some artificial intelligence to help analyze those images from the CCTV. 
So that's, you know, technologies to fight uh, illegal, unregulated, unreported fisheries. Now, aquaculture is very important too. Um, so we look, uh, you know, we have started recently working with Fairagora on using some technologies for standards for aquaculture ASC. So with that, I'll give the mic to Juliet. Thank you, Kun Fan. Um, so I'll first give like a short overview of what we're doing at Ferragora Asia. So we're a consultancy company, and we, we, when we began to work, uh, the main goal was really to improve sustainability regarding the production of food and working closely with producers. What we noticed is that there are many challenges regarding uh, achieving better standards uh, in terms of environmental, social improvement, and one of the things we notice also is that when we go towards um, certification standards, um, many of the countries in Southeast Asia, many of the smallholder farmers face a lot of difficulties to understand the standards to meet the requirements. So we came up with this idea of trying to uh, build a bridge between farmers who want to do better and these standards that can sometimes be very complicated. What we did is also to build technology, see how we could use uh, applications to help farmers in um, achieving these goals. So how we build our projects, usually we first have to engage stakeholders. We never work alone. We always have to work with buyers, with farmers, with standard owners, and with NGO. Um, because what we want to do is really create, foster this whole energy of working all together to achieve the same goals. Um, when we partner with standard owners, we adapt our technology. So we have a web application and a mobile application that fit the standards. And we have um, this really important goal to adapt the technology to farmers' needs as well. So for example, when we work with standards that don't have any translation in Thai, and we work with Thai farmers, then we're going to translate the whole standard and adapt the questions so that farmers, depending on uh, whether they're small scale farms or big farms, can understand it. We train farmers, so this is a very important part also. Using technology just as a technology provider doesn't work uh, most of the time. There's a whole part which is about going on the field being with farmers, communicating, creating line group, being able to answer to their questions real time, not only just providing a tool and just then disappearing. Um, and then as a last step, we analyze the, dat the data, we provide reports, we provide gap analysis, and we provide advice to help them. Always working with the private sector, the companies, because one of our key learning lessons is that in agriculture, in aquaculture, Farmers will do effort if there's a benefit for them, which kind of makes sense. I think we're all the same. Um, so I'm just going to give a sh short overview of the kind of projects we've been doing so far. So we've worked a lot in sugarcane industry. Uh, some of our uh, partners were uh, Nestle, PepsiCo, um, and we worked a lot with the standard owner, Bon Sucre. So we have uh, some project also uh, funded by USAID, which uh, is helping so much to fund the project and put uh, all the partners together to work together. Um, and we worked uh, a lot on social aspects as well. So there we have been doing some trials using blockchain technology for working contracts, for example, ensuring that uh, we reduce the risk of forced labor uh, in the supply chain. And we worked a lot in aquaculture, in shrimp, um, in the shrimp industry. So we had some past projects in Vietnam. In Vietnam, mostly working with small-scale farmers. And I'm coming now to this new project that we started recently with Thai Union in uh, Thailand. So um, this is a project that is funded by ICO. And we're working with uh, standard owners ASC. So I'm not sure if everyone is aware about ASC. Maybe you've heard more of MSC for, for wild catch fisheries. So ASC is for the aquaculture part. Um, so it's a standard that's going to ensure that the production is sustainable, uh, that it's um, meeting the requirements in terms of social standards, environmental standards. 
Um, so the objective of the project uh, was first uh, to adapt the uh, platform, um, the Reficate platform. So we made sure to have the full ASC standard integrated in the platform. So it's kind of a checklist um, which um, is easy for under to understand for the user, so they can assess where they are in terms of compliance with this standard. It's all translated in Thai, and they can also upload all their documents um, in the same platform. Uh, the second thing was to train farmers, of course, because when you use technology, you need to make sure that uh, the users will be able to um, understand it fully. One of the key lessons there, I would say, is that Technology can help as long as it doesn't bring extra work compared to what it would be without technology. Um, and this is why we keep improving uh, the platform all the time and really getting the feedback from farmers. Um, and then the last step, step is to have provide a gap analysis. So we're currently uh, finalizing the analysis for one of the farm uh, to help them to assess what they might need to uh, adjust before getting the audit. Um, so we had a field trip actually last month, um, it was like the first field trip, uh, we visited three farms uh, on three days and did a, a training. Uh, it was really interesting to see how committed they were and if I compare with previous projects where we would uh, work with farmers and there were no standard owner, um, no certification involved, I have to say that uh, they were much more committed. Uh, <laughs> to do efforts knowing that they were aiming at a certification um, at the end of the journey. Uh, it was really interesting also to see how Thai Union was really involved in supporting the farms. Uh, so clearly the, the farmers, the farm owners had all the knowledge about the standard uh, and they had been uh, really supported in terms of um, checking which document is needed and they're still being supported um, also even to use the technology. So we have staff from Thai Union uh, which are also helping the farmers to use the, the application. Um, it was also very good to get all the feedback regarding how to improve the application because one, one key lesson is that each farm is different. So it's very hard to build a tool that will fit all kind of farms, small farms, big farms, and different type of management. Um, so going on the field, meeting, and, and going on the farm makes it possible to assess, OK, oh, they have different type of plants. We need to adjust this certain checklist because uh, it has to fit their needs. So we do have long-term perspective for this project because this, I would say this was just the first stone um, and the project is not finished, but on the very long term, um, we've been working with ASC also in Vietnam and we really uh, like working with this standard and we would like to explore interconnectivity between the, the ASC system and our system because at the end of the day, the aim is to make sure that farmers don't have too much work, but it's not that extra burden to achieve these uh, sustainability requirements and standards. So basically, if we can manage to make sure that they enter data in only one place, but it's easy to enter. So we're exploring new ways to also for them to uh, upload the data. Um, basically, it's going to take them less time. And if with this data, we can do some analysis and make sure that it's actually like helping them in their everyday life then it's like a win-win situation. So that's really the aim, is all the data collection, make sure we're helping them to get the audit, but also adapt the tool to meet their needs. Um, it can be analysis of uh, water ana um, the water quality, it can be uh, making complex models to assess which feed is more efficient. So this is all these kind of um, possibilities that we're exploring together with them and building the tool with them. Um, as key learnings, I would say, from this project and more in general in aquaculture, I would say that I uh, have a feeling that aquaculture is moving towards like adopting more and more technology. We have sensors in the ponds, uh, we can ha use IoT, we can connect and, and use all these data analysis uh, to get better. And I really believe that this is the way forward toward better sustainability. Um, in terms of uh, means to achieve these objectives, standards, certification are a possibility. But then in, I'm going to leave the question open and I'm 
totally willing to talk about it because I think standards raise a lot of questions as well. It's not all black and white, uh, and there's a lot to talk about it. Uh, uh, so I will leave it open. Thank you for your attention. We have we have ten minutes for um, Q and A. Anyone have a question? Please raise your hand. Hi, my name is uh, Manuel Madani. I'm with the NCC. I was just wondering, like in agriculture, the the feed for uh, for the fish also leaves an environmental footprint. W what are the other resources um, Thai Union could be considering, or is there any other developments in the future coming up? Thank you very much. So yes, um, I think the feed issues. Uh, for example, you could use um, like. About, I think last year we looked into pilot projects of um, using natural gas to produce protein, et cetera. And other one is, uh, you know, we actually have a lot of tuna processing, so byproduct of tuna could be used as a source, um, you know, to, to replace wild caught fish meal, et cetera. And we also invest in things like alternative proteins uh, from insects, from plants. Uh, you might see that we recently invest in some um, ventures capital um, in Singapore and also in Thailand on alternative proteins. Thank you. Um, Sorry, I'm uh, Geoko Posker from, uh, from NCT Data, and, and thank you for sharing the showcase. I really liked it. Um, we, we did a similar project in agriculture, so not aquaculture, agriculture, where we created an app for an, uh, a big client of us, and we actually found that it was very difficult to convince the farmer that it was a vendor agnostic um, app actually helping them do their business because they were constantly feeling that there was somebody behind them that was actually using their data and that actually in the end uh, let's say the Monsantos of this world were actually getting better of it do you have similar experiences yes <laughs> um, one of the first challenges we faced uh, specifically at the beginning of the whole uh, project so Fagora is six years old um, and I haven't been in Fergo for six years old, but like I know, like my director just told me the whole history. And uh, one of the main challenges indeed was that farmers didn't understand where the data were going. And no matter how much we would explain things, it was, it was really hard. Uh, what we noticed is that when we uh, give this answer before they ask, it's helping because then they know it's a concern. Um, and it's, I mean, still today we haven't found the perfect solution. We still have, like, we always need to talk a lot about it, explain exactly um, who is accessing their data, that they own their data because, like, this is, we comply with the European regulations, so if they want to retrieve this data, it's erased and that's it, and no one will have access to it. Um, so this is one of the things we try to communicate a lot on. Uh, and we had like this project with the blockchain uh, technology. Um, this was one of the, uh, this was a very hard point also because like uh, the concept of blockchain, <laughs> it's like, I mean, farmers didn't understand it and they were like, okay, but where is the data going? And I remember this farmer was like, it's going there. <laughs> it's like, um, so it makes, it's ma it makes it hard, and what we realize also is that um, it's specifically harder when we don't have the support of the private sector, of, of, the, of the buyers, of, of the processing plant, because then there's, it's harder to get the trust. When we have projects, uh, for example, this project with Thai Union, we have the support of Thai Union, so then the farms have no problem in putting the data in the system. There's, abs they, there's, there's no... Um, you know, like fences towards this. Uh, but whenever we want to work with farmers outside of this kind of big project with a lot of partners, and we just want to try to come up with some solutions to help them, it's like very hard. Um, 
we, we need more incentives uh, and, and we need this, this trust to be built and it takes time. Um, yeah, and we had like, initially we, our goal was to like reach out to many, many farmers and then we realized it's not possible. That's not how it works. You have to do it like very slowly, get the trust and then, okay, move to other group of farms and, and that's how it works, which is okay, which is makes it more interesting and more human. <laughs> Yeah, we, we actually had the same experiences. Uh, also on the other side from um, so using the data and then getting, let's say, advice back. And they were like, but how do I know that this is actually real advice, the good advice? Because you're now advising me like product X to put on my plants, but why w would I not use product I from another vendor? Things like this, and that makes it really difficult. We were thinking. also thinking millions, that was not happening. <laughs> yeah, we have to be realistic. <laughs> Any more questions, anyone? We still have a few minutes left. No further questions? Three, two, one. Everything clear? Okay. Well, thank you very much then. Great. Thank you. A round of applause indeed. Presentation of the SBF today, SBF 20. The, uh, panel discussion uh, with the CEO on uh, how to make the sustainability as a corporate strategy. And um, we are joined uh, by the panelists, which I'll be introducing to you, uh, each and every one of them, and including the moderator. But uh, before uh, we uh, start the panel, dis uh, panel discussion, I would like to uh, uh, show you two videos of our great sponsors. Uh, they are L'Oreal and Aventury. Let's take a look. Social challenges. With bold 2030 targets, our goal is to ensure our activities are respectful of the planet's boundaries. 100% of our sites will be carbon neutral by 2025. 100% of the industrial water used in our plants will be recycled and reused by 2030. 100% of our bio-based ingredients and packaging materials will be sustainably sourced by 2030. 100% of the plastics for packaging will come from recycled or bio-based sources by 2030. 100,000 people from underprivileged communities will gain access to employment by 2030. We will make available the information on the environmental and social impact of our products. But reducing our impact is not enough. We want to make a positive contribution to society. We are creating a 50 million euros charitable endowment fund to support highly vulnerable women. We are also allocating 50 million euros to help restore 1 million hectares of degraded ecosystems and 50 million euros to promote a more circular economy. With these objectives, we want to inspire people to take action for a more sustainable future. We are out for the future.
once again thanks to uh, L'Oreal and Venturi for making this forum possible. And now all of my panelists and the moderators are already on the stage, starting uh, with Ms. Uh, Ines Caldera, Managing Director of uh, L'Oreal Thailand, Mr. Dan Patombanit, CEO of NRF, Mr. Florian Benhold, CEO of uh, Symbio Solar, and uh, the moderators are Ms. Ahmel uh, LeBiong, founder and CEO of Green Building Consulting and Engineering, and Mr. Ongri de Rabul, founder and CEO of Fighters Asia. So uh, after this session, we'll have a, a lucky draw and uh, some networking uh, cocktail session. So enjoy the discussion. I give the mic to uh, Armel to start. Thank you, uh, and thank you for being here uh, today. Um, so this panel discussion will be discussing about uh, how your companies are actually uh, having st sustainability as a component of your corporate strategy. Uh, all of you in different uh, industries, whether it is renewable energy, uh, beauty, and uh, food, uh, you're all uh, having really this a big uh, story about having sustainability at the core of your operations, of your organizations, of their supply chains, and even your products and solutions. So my, my, my first question will be uh, to you, uh, Ines, uh, and it's a question that I'll be asking to all three of you. Um, as this is really part of your uh, corporate strategy, can you explain to us uh, how it actually translates into business value? Hello. Yeah. So good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, today, so uh, I would uh, um, I would answer to you in a, uh, in a very direct uh, way. Um, there are some things that can they are not tangible or you know business in in the sense of money, but they definitely create value. And uh, sustainability is uh, very very high in our agenda because it's directly linked with the, the value you attribute to reputation. And I always give the example of, um, and I, th I think some of, uh, of you in the audience will relate to this, it's the same as sending your kids to Harvard Business School, right? You send them with the expectation that after such a big investment, they will get a better job with a high payoff. So it's exactly the, the, the journey uh, that L'Oreal has been uh, committed to. We started many years ago uh, believing that sustainability and, um, responsib and the way we, 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 um, we act in the community had high value for the future. So that has helped us build our reputation as a, uh, as a company, but mostly we believe that consumers will already do, but even more in the future, attribute great importance and uh, prefer companies that have had uh, a strong commitment with sustainability. So I think it's, it depends on how you value reputation. Can you introduce maybe some uh, of your initiatives also? Are you doing it real in this area? I, c I can, I can. There is, uh, I think this uh, calendar shows some of the initiatives and and the purpose of, of the slide I think it's just to show you that it's not something that is just because it's popular or because it's you know today's agenda so we start started in 1979 with big initiatives uh, related with reconstructed skin you must know uh, or you I uh, I can share with you that beauty um, is uh, or used to be, you know, very very little in terms of animal testing. Yet there was a, a big noise uh, when um, surrounding that topic. And already in the 80s, we were the number one pro producer of artificial skin to really avoid uh, animal testing uh, in the future. And today, I'm very proud to say that. Uh, we don't do any animal testing. Then uh, there was a lot on social uh, audits that we were also pioneers in, in the beginning of the uh, 2000. Um, and in 2013, the group has made a, a lot of announcements regarding a program which was Sharing Beauty with All. Sharing Beauty with All was created in 2013 with very concrete milestones to deliver this year, 2020. And uh, we achieved them. Uh, 
uh, and we took the opportunity to reinforce that commitment and to announce new targets for 2030 that are super ambitious. And that's the new program, L'Oreal for the Future. Thank you. I'll ask you uh, then, uh, Kundan, the same uh, question. Um, as you also have sustainability in, uh, as a component of your corporate strategy, can you explain to us uh, how it translates into business value and introduce yourself as well? Sure, so we're, I'm, not, I'm not a L'Oreal, but um, I, I, th I think I'm, I'm probably a little bit more relatable in the sense that I'm, I'm Thai, I'm from Thailand, and my, back, my background actually is um, in M&A. So um, we basically buy companies, we've bought um, over the course of a decade, about a billion dollars worth of companies um, between our family and institutional, um, primarily focused on food. Um, this particular company we, we acquired four years ago and it was acquired from a entrepreneur. Um, and you know, you know w once you complete an acquisition, I mean, the first thing you do is you try to figure out what you bought, right? I mean, this is, this is basic. And what I discovered, which has kind of changed my life, and I think it's, it's gonna change the life of many, um, and it certainly changed the life of our organization, is um, when we looked at what was the most important thing that would drive um, consumer demand, um, as well as legislation and regulation moving forward, not just in Thailand, because we're, but, but overseas, because we're 100% export, uh, was sustainability, right? And, uh, you know, we, we, I, I love what you said just now about, you know, being ambitious. And I, I think that we are at our core ambitious people. And at first I'd set my sights, you know, we wanted to be a leader in sustainability in ASEAN and then became Asia. And then we decided, well, you know what, we have to be the biggest in the world from our own little niche market relative in size. Okay. Um, so that became our core strategy is how do we, how do we win the minds of our customers, um, both on a B2B and B2C level with sustainability, from corporate initiatives all the way down to actually um, groundwork initiatives within Thailand, and then policy initiatives at both a national level, regional level, and a global level. So we're doing, we're doing quite a lot across the spectrum of, you know, if you, if you look up kind of climate change, you know, what the UN Global Compact is on, I'm on several committees. So, how does that actually translate into tangible kind of business? And I didn't really prepare any slides because I felt, um, you know, maybe we should just simply talk about it. And uh, I, I think it's quite simple. So at the core of what we're doing is we are uh, OEM manufacturer, value added, 70% um, OEM, 30% brand. Um, and we manufacture um, food, very simple. How do we distinguish ourselves is exactly through um, our sustainability programs because our clients want companies that are value aligned with them, right? Whether it's B2B, whether it's B2C, whether it's their end consumers or not, they want a story. And that's what we've given them and that's how we stand out. I've literally won tenders at the end of the day when same price, same quality, at the end of the day they asked who's the owner, right? Or who, who runs the company? You know, you choose me, right? The only carbon neutral f factory in Thailand that's food or you know, you choose maybe some local guy, right? With a, you know, I'm, I'm not, well, okay. Anyways, so, I mean, the, the, the decision is clear. We've won multiple tenders um, on that basis. So I think that's a, a, on a very simple basis. And, you know, across our three-year um, transformation, I'll be very quick, um, you know, the next tangible benefit is we're about to list on the stock exchange. Tomorrow's our first day um, trading uh, on the stock exchange of Thailand. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I think the most tangible result we'll get will be ESG. And so we are going to drive towards um, an ESG score. We hope to be um, take a leadership role in the segment, uh, you know. And obviously, the benefits of ESG is you know green financing, right? So definitely lower cost of financing, um, a diversified um, institutional base of shareholders um, and whatnot. And so that's as a public company. Um, I, I think with with respect to um, very simply in terms of sales and connections and networking, you know. Uh, I think I'm honored to be here, and I'm also honored to be uh, privileged in, in many um, panels and discussions around the world in different um, forums. And I think the most interesting thing is you, you get to meet a lot of different people, and they eventually become partners and clients. And so our mission, really, um, at the end of the day, is how do we feed 30 billion people in a sustainable, inclusive manner through food system transformation? And how we're going to do that is basically build production capacity around the world in key markets, focusing on alternative protein across the multiple different type of categories from cellular meat to plant-based meats, et cetera. Yeah. 
Thank you so much for sharing. Really interesting to see how it actually translates uh, for you into ESG, into financial value as well. Uh, gaining also uh, contracts and a competitive advantage is something that can, I think a lot of people here in the room can relate to in their own business. Uh, attractivity, reputation, and image is also something that I think a lot of people can take away. Now, uh, for you, uh, Florian, I have the same question. Can you introduce yourself and tell us how sustainability translates uh, into business value in your industry? Can you use that? So my name is Florian Benhold. I'm the CEO of uh, Symbio Solar. Um, so pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I think for us, it's, it's a very simple. Sustainability is our business. Um, this is the service that we're providing to our clients. Uh, so our mission is to help our clients to achieve their sustainability goals um, uh, while saving money, and most importantly, allowing them to focus on their core business and letting us help them achieve their sustainability goals at the same time. Um, so that's why I, I would like to take a little bit of a, a different viewpoint because um, basically similar to uh, uh, Condan, you know, we identified this, uh, this opportunity in, in supporting uh, clients across multiple industries. So today our main activity is providing, um, you know, powering our clients' business by the sun um, using state-of-the-art solar rooftop systems um, to clients uh, as varied as Michelin, uh, Dole, Thai Union, uh, many of them you have seen here today, SIG, um, and um, uh, in, in many different industries. So what, what we would like to do is to help them uh, be a partner for them in, a, in the journey of decarbonization and at the same time letting them focus on you know tires, uh, seafood, packaging uh, to make sure that uh, they achieve their business goals at the same time. Um, but what I think is, is quite important and I think that's why also this year um, is quite important uh, when the pandemic happened earlier in the year I think uh, many uh, many people were worried about their their balance sheets about their financing about their supply chain um, actually one of our greatest concern because this is such an important thing for for our clients motivation to promote sustainability that is our business um, we were very worried that this would take a back seat um, and so I would like to take a quick look at what the pandemic actually has done uh, for for sustainability and I think um, um, overall to me, it has really done three different things. The, the first thing is, this is at the heart of it, a, an environmental crisis, right? The, the, the pandemic is an environmental um, effect. And so despite the warning shots, uh, be it SARS or, or uh, H1N1, um, we, we have not been prepared. Uh, so I think that's the first effect, and that's very similar to the, the global climate crisis, where we are aware of, of a very bad impact coming our way, and at the moment, we are not prepared. So the second thing is, uh, you know, at the end of 2019, many people looked at their supply chains and the global economy in general as being something massive and quite invincible. And, uh, you know, three months later, many people realized, actually, we are quite vulnerable. Um, so I think that's a second effect that really brought environmental issues to the fore um, as a major risk factor that can disrupt businesses from one day to the other. Um, and the third one is the effect of, of empty treasury coffers, be that in the public sector or in the private sector, which, um, you know, that was where our main concern was that this would reduce the appetite for sustainability. But I think now, six months on, um, uh, at least my observation in our own business and also globally, I think actually it is an accelerant. I think 2020 is really a turning point, a pivotal year in um, anybody who has had doubts about the importance of sustainability as part of the core corporate strategy um, has now realized it has to be there and it has to be a main driver. Dan pointed out consumers, that's where you always have to start. Um, consumers, especially young consumers um, with a big majority are looking for sustainable products, sustainable consumption. Um, Mathieu from Harmless Harvest pointed out they're also willing to pay more for this. Um, so that, that drives a lot of demand and a lot of transition in, in the industry. And uh, then risk mitigation. Uh, McKinsey estimates that between 25 to 70 percent on average of EBITDA for every company in the world is at risk, um, particularly from climate risks or other sustainably related risks. So today, really, it doesn't matter if you are doing the right thing because you believe you have to be a good corporate citizen and this is your obligation um, uh, as part of a global society, or if you're simply looking at um, 
mitigating risks in your supply chain, uh, looking at uh, creating superior returns, uh, lower cost of financing um, in your business. This is the right thing to do. And I think we see that clearly with our clients. And this is really the, the driver for the growth of our business. Very interesting points. Uh, I completely agree with the fact that there's a multi-value uh, proposition to sustainability. It goes across uh, just risk mitigation is also one of them. And it's be becoming bigger and ESG is also one of the criteria that is looking towards this. So very interesting points. Thank you very much. I'll let Henry then uh, move to yeah. the next topic. <laughs> so sustainability is not only in production or, or selling. It's very much about supply chain or, or you relate with the supplier. And in a sector like, like food, Kundan is involved in Thailand, farmers, agriculture, it's a huge part of the economy and also part of the challenge of the country. So in your case, um, NRF is not only taking care of having a responsible supply chain, but you are, are doing much more like, like with your program with knowledge sharing program with 1,500 farmers. Can you tell us more about it? Sure. Um, thank you. So, it, it, it's funny. I, I've, I've, you know, we, we were a signatory to the UN Global Compact since uh, I remember August first, two thousand seventeen. And when I thought about it, how how we could impact, right? And I looked across the kind of the UN SDG goals, and I looked at the KPI. Um, you know, we, you know, the, the the glaring thing was about poverty and farmers, and that was the first focus we had. And so that's, that's kind of where we focused our efforts on the upstream component. And, and oftentimes, when I talk about UNSGG in a, in a very common way, um, people ask me, you know, well, how do you, how do you implement? How, is that, how, do you, how do you impact people through the UNSDGs? And um, you know, the, the simple answer for a lot of companies is procurement. You directly have a decision you, are, you directly make a decision that can impact somebody's lives and whether you want to beat him down to the bone or you can help pull them up, make them more productive, and then raise their income levels, right? And then um, you, you, they become part of a sustainable, uh, sustainable supply chain, right? And, and that's exactly what we did according to um, our KPIs, which is how do we help actually over the next 10 years at the very minimum 10,000 um, farmers out of poverty and increase their um, average income by 50% on an annualized basis. And so that's our own goal. And part and parcel to that is really education. And it's tough. You know, we have a sustainability team and that has often cried um, at, at many points throughout the entire year because it's very difficult to deal with farmers. And so you've got to handhold them um, and you've got to educate them on, uh, on a few things. So number one, why this is important Right. Uh, number two is is that this will make you richer, <laughs> because at at the end of the day, the the thing that the problem with farmers is they live day to day, and so if they can get say you know five baht more per kilo, than they can from me in like um, say thirty days, they'll take it, and so you know ignore the contract. So that's the problem, right? And so you know it's not like a rent rent seeking relationship. Um, and, and so in order to do that, you've got to educate them on, on a few things. Um, so, um, you know, why we're doing it, you know, how to do it to improve and, you know, the technology behind it, you know, where I'm part of um, Grow Asia as well, where we're looking at, you know, kind of digital technologies and communities. Um, and how do we get existing farmer groups, um, you know, and then link them into kind of like a, a more broader kind of um, network where they can um, be more competitive and sell product. And so what we do is we teach them this. And I know it's, it sounds like a lot, and it's, quite, it's, it's a very difficult task. And you know, we, we, we do that. Sometimes I go out there as well. But primarily it's my team, and we go out there, and we, we, we talk to farmers from around the country. Thanks, Kundan. Um, Ines, uh, Laurel is not in the food industry, but you, you understand among your many initiatives, you, you have been finding a way to support uh, farmers uh, in Thailand with, I understand, rice oil, with cooperatives. Can you tell us more? Because it's amazing. Oh, th uh, thank you very much. So th first, th this was done by my predecessor. So I'm just, uh, you know, representing what the amazing work she has done. 
Yeah, I don't know if you know, but rice, uh, apart from being very good, uh, it has also uh, properties when it comes to anti-dandruff and ad antioxidant properties. So our scientific community discovered that, and they said, well, you know, we need to, coming back to procurement, we need to source uh, our demand from somewhere, so they chose Thailand, and uh, we use, uh, so every um, rice brain oil used in any L'Oreal product in the world comes from Thailand, and that's, that's amazing, from the Aizan, Aizan? Re Izan, Izan uh, uh, region, and it's a very poor part of the country. So we were uh, we, we chose to partner with um, four uh, cooperatives, uh, and therefore uplift and uh, uh, the the life of 600 farmers uh, that every year you know uh, commit with a, a certain level of of production. So that is uh, an important part of the project. And then the second part of the project is that we also contribute to the reforestation of um, of that part. So because of course you know intensive uh, use of land uh, ha brings other issues. So we um, we ask for the rice, but then we plant again to make sure that all ecosystem is sustainable. So, you know, next time you use a shampoo from L'Oreal, you know, Thailand has a, so a you part of it. You, you chose Thailand for sourcing your, your rice oil. Yes. I hope you will choose Thailand to invest a new fund. You are, you are starting to invest in refrigeration on diversity. Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> absolutely. I'll let the, the, the microphone to Armel for, for carbon neutrality. Yeah, thank you. Um, Yes, I wanted to speak a bit about uh, carbon neutrality, uh, and uh, I'll have a question for you, uh, Florian, first. Uh, so, well, we all know that to achieve these goals, uh, we need renewable energy, so solar. It's a big part of it. Um, but it has its limitations in how we can actually offset the whole carbon footprint of a business operations. Can you tell us uh, if, you, if you do anything to help your clients to achieve carbon neutrality beyond solar? Sure. Um Again, our, our mission is really to be to be a partner to help our clients to reduce their emissions, especially from scope two and, and one emissions, um, uh, all the way to zero if we can. Um, and right now, for solar, for let's say an average uh, factory in Thailand, you will generally achieve between 20 to 40 percent of the total power generation. It really depends on the roof size, on the consumption pattern, and so on and so forth. Um, and then this is really the, the bread and butter, and especially if the clients have um, still a very strong cost-saving focus, um, because it is a profitable activity today, uh, then this will, this will be hard to go beyond that. Uh, but we, uh, this, this really is a client-driven activity, so um, with some of our clients that are basically are telling us we do, our target is carbon neutrality, and we're looking to implement that. W this is not a cost-saving measure, but it's a, um, uh, it's a carbon re emission reduction measure. Um, then we have actually helped one of our clients, NOV, in the, in the jewelry industry. Um, again, their sustainability is the core of their business. Um, this is the value proposition to their clients. Um, we have been able to install a, a battery system to, to complement the solar system in order to increase the share of um, solar in their um, in the energy mix and achieving now about 70 to 75 percent and are targeting to bring them all the way up to 100 percent, um, adding on um, other, uh, other support systems. The, the last mile, the last one or two percent um, is the most difficult uh, and, and that is probably something where you'd have to use a, a kind of offset mechanism um, using credits um, or something of that sort in order to be uh, cost competitive, um, at least in the, in the short term. But uh, actually, we, we have been recently uh, um, uh, had an, an investment from, from Siemens, um, and that is one of the partnerships that we are looking to, to be able to actually go beyond solar, looking into energy efficiency, electrification um, for transport and, and overall um, activities. Um, and we also have a team on the biomass side to address uh, uh, especially the heat load in, in industrial processes, so providing heat from sustainably sourced biomass uh, that are all installed on site. And with all of these activities, I think uh, the important thing here, and that's addressed a bit the last point I mentioned earlier, the empty treasury coffers, um, we're aiming to, to invest on behalf of our client and delivering this as a, as a, you know, a positive impact on their, on their bottom line um, while achieving the sustainability goals. And I understand this is also some things that you're applying to your own uh, business organization as well. 
Yes, I, I have to admit that uh, it's, it's still uh, early steps. We're still very much focused on, on driving the, the growth of the business. But um, yes, we believe that's very important. We, we have to lift the, the sustainability commitments that we rely on from our clients. Um, so uh, we, we're looking to electrify the, the fleet of service vehicles, for example, um, which is still a challenge, especially here in Thailand. Um, and uh, um, I think lastly, one other item I want to highlight because the biggest challenge actually in emission reduction is uh, the scope three. Um, uh, so anything that is not under your control in, in the supply chain um, and, and with your consumers in terms of the use of product. Um, and I, I recently was listening to uh, Alan Job from, from Unilever, um, you know, notably one of the leaders in, in the sustainability for fast moving consumer goods. And he pointed out that the scope one emissions for Unilever are only representing 3% of the total life cycle carbon emissions. Um, and so I think this is really an important aspect that, that's often underestimated in terms of its relevance. Um, and so here our approach is to have a regional footprint um, covering all of Asia so that we are also able to uh, support the supply chains of our clients um, to take the same steps um, together with, uh, with our clients. And we're seeing that actually being um, implemented in the requirements for, uh, for the supply. So um, similar to what Dan mentioned, when, when uh, contracts are tendered out, uh, there is a requirement of having renewable energy content and so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, uh, and then either from Symbio, of course, for one of our competitors to, uh, to be implemented at the, at the supply chain sites as well. And that's really where the, the real challenge is, it's raw materials and the supply chain. Thank you very much. My next question is uh, to you, uh, Ines. Um, so, as you said in your, in your introduction, you have really ambitious uh, goals for carbon neutrality uh, for L'Oreal. I think it's 2025. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've also seen that you have a, a lot of commitments uh, and been scoring an A in uh, the carbon disclosure program for quite a few years now on climate change. Um, as a global company, what are the challenges to meet these commitments? And how does this translate into in Asia? Okay, so it's very difficult to be in a panel with experts because they know a lot uh, about it. So I, I, I can tell you that, um, so in terms of what we have achieved so far, L'Oreal is present in 130 countries, which means that each time we announce something, uh, it's not just about you know doing that in Thailand or doing that in France, you need to do it everywhere. Um, so I think th uh, the numbers I'm going to tell you are particularly relevant if you take into account these, uh, uh, the geographies where we are in. So, so far we reduced our CO2 by 78% while increasing, uh, um, increasing the production by 37%. So it's really, you know, it, it really demanded, uh, demanded a lot of uh, commitment and a lot of changes in our supply uh, chain and the way we, we operate. Um, I believe now 35% of our uh, sites are re already carbon neutral, out of which 14 of our factories. And as you said, by 2025, we are committed and we will deliver for sure to have 100% carbon neutrality in all our uh, operation and uh, end sites. I guess uh, the biggest challenge uh, we have is that a lot of those sites were already in place. So transforming them without totally disrupting the value chain and creating other problems would be for me the, the biggest challenge. It's not impossible at all. But uh, it demands a lot of investment, it demands a lot of thinking, and it takes some time. But I think by 2025 we'll be able to deliver on, on the commitments uh, we have. And we do partner with, uh, with, uh, with other uh, companies to help us achieve that, uh, uh, that, goal, uh, that goal. Great to hear. <laughs> Uh, I'm now going to move uh, to uh, the uh, to the question that is going to be for Florian, <laughs> if you want to know. I'm going to move to the qu uh, to questions on circularity. Um, there's uh, often a question about uh, solar panels and their end of life and their recyclability. And uh, I know that you're not manufacturing your panels uh, on your own, but um, do you, are you working towards circular solar? Uh, can you tell us a bit more about how this is uh, going into in Thailand and in the region in general? Um, so, overall, uh, 
the, the this is I think one of the one of the problems in the industry as you pointed out um, I think today uh, in theory um, you can recycle about 90 to 95 percent of, of a solar panel um, so it, it, technically that is possible um, I, I did read a report uh, that uh, in in practice uh, that that number is about 10 percent today so that that's certainly a big issue um, and uh, I'm sure um, a number of these are ending up in landfill um, but Again, as, as you can see, for most of the clients uh, that, um, that have sustainability ambitions, um, circularity is an important one. So, so there we face questions all the time, how about end of life? Um, who will take care of the panels? Um, how can we ensure zero landfill? Um, so these are things that we're passing on to, to our suppliers um, and, and we, we're selecting suppliers that have a, a better plan there. Uh, the, the fundamental issue here is that the, um, the glut of the end-of-life products, at least in Southeast Asia, is going to come in about 20 years. Um, really, solar was non-existent in, in most of Southeast Asia uh, before the, the 2010s. So you have a life si lifetime of maybe 20, 30 years. So about 2030, that's when you're going to have some volume appearing in terms of end-of-life panels. And I think the way until there is going to be very difficult. Um, and we rely on suppliers at the moment to take back product. Um, but uh, working towards the goal of, of zero landfill, I think it is a must, um, because otherwise you just cannot meet the goals of, of the, the clients that are associated with, uh, with sustainability. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, yes. So, so in the in the food industry, uh, I, I know NRF is also being very, very, very careful about uh, restoring circular economy. Because actually, it, it, it's the original farm from from a few decades ago. It was natural, but now it's modernized, and, and you have to deal with the waste. So I, I think you're working on, on this. Can you can you tell us more about it? Yeah. So I think especially here in Thailand, where there's uh, there's a great use of um, you know pesticides and chemicals, un un unfortunately, um, that the education of people as well as farmers in terms of how they farm is extremely important. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, best practice globally is you want regenerative farming, right? So you want regenerative agriculture. What you take out, you put back in, and. Um, what we do is, you know, our goal is zero waste within our facilities. And, you know, to take, to take this waste and then we give it to our farmers in which we then educate them how they can make their own fertilizer. And, um, and w with that, we've actually ex expanded the program. And now um, we actually collect waste from other factories as well. And uh, we give it to the farmers and actually it becomes like a little lifestyle for them. Um, I think, I think, uh, the entire issue of circular economy is extremely important, and e even um, food that is close to weight spoilage, right, can play an extremely important role. Um, so, for example, um, we ha sometimes we have products that that we don't use anymore, and what we do is that we combine that with other food that from other um, from other companies that is close to sp spoilage, and then we actually then we um, we distribute it to um, people within poor communities and then they are able to have more nutritious meals. Um, and then we take that waste, right? And then the waste from that stream, and we can donate back to the farmers. So it is um, really a big circular kind of loop um, in, that, in that regard. Thanks very much. Now, now we will keep 10 minutes for, for 10 minutes or more for, for question for the audience. The audience here, or the audience, uh, digital audience. If we can have questions, we have questions from, from people who are, who are connected with us from different countries in the region or in, in Europe. So there will be microphone to, to, to be given to, to the audience by, by our colleague from the, you want one of the microphone here? You can, yeah. So please raise your hand if you have some question at that stage. So the, the, the panelists are so impressive that they are, everybody doesn't have any I questions. I think it's the open bar that's waiting outside. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that'll make a short question. Um, would you consider sustainability a niche market? For everyone? I, I think it's, it's, it's very interesting for, for lawyers especially, no? 
Because later on, I suppose to address <laughs> all the markets, but uh, it, it, there is a specific market for, for, for very, very sustainable products in the cosmetic industry. Um, how can I answer that? So the numbers show that it's still small. The numbers show that consumers declare that they are willing to pay more, but in the moment of truth, they don't, right? And, and that is a vicious cycle. But having said that, we see more and more that young people, they will be willing to do that. So it's nice when you say that because you're, it's your parents paying for you. So let's see how they do when it's their own money. Uh, but but we are seeing uh, we are seeing an increase in interest. Let's put it this way. I think for many years, and I'm not just uh, I'm not talking just about L'Oreal, but uh, we, companies use that as an excuse. So I think now it's also the moment where we need just to do and to put in the market uh, sustainable products and then consumers won't have an option. Uh, because otherwise there won't be significant change and uh, not fast enough. So still small, a disconnection between uh, I want to be a good citizen, yes of course I, I privilege and uh, sustainability and what I want to pay. Uh, so we need to, to change gear and just not give the option. Uh, yes, thanks very much for the answer. I, I, yes, I, I wanted to, to ask uh, Kundan to answer this question because you, you said that sustainability is part of your company DNA, but you're exporting to, to Europe. So the, the niche market in Europe is much bigger of sustainable food, organic food, or healthy food. But what about addressing the Asian market or the Thailand market, which is where well, it's still a niche? Are you trying to do that, or, or, or is, is, why do you see that? Well, we're quite, um, we, so we export across 25 markets around the world. Um, so we're, we're not as diversified, but we're somewhat diversified. And by the way, if I was female, I'd be using your products. Okay, <laughs> great, great stuff. so many women. <laughs> there you go, okay. I'm gonna go out there and buy the products tomorrow. <laughs> um, I, I think when you think about sustainability, I think you gotta, it, it's like an investment. Right. So, where do where do all corporate where do, where do all corporates spend their money? And that is to win mind share, to win um, you know brand awareness, right? Because the most difficult thing is that you know a consumer is walking down a supermarket, and I'm quite specific towards consumer um, products. They're walking down the supermarket. There's like a hundred products on the shelf that look exactly the same, and you're going to want him to be aware and to zero down into your one product, and then. Um, decide whether he's going to buy it or not, right? And then the next decision is that once he buys it, is that he repeats it again. And once he's got that third purchase, you know you've got him, right? And so that, that awareness is important, which is why most corporates around the world, they spend all their money to win the mind shares of millennials because it is the single largest segment from a population perspective in maybe 10 or 20 years from now, a wallet share perspective, right? And so if you can, um, and you're very somewhat long-term oriented, and I, I do agree on the, the, the purchasing, um, that you want to you wanna capture this market. Um, for, for me, to, to make it very close to home, uh, consumers are now uh, using their wallet to change the world in a way. So, you know, how do you, um, rather than buying a simple hamburger, you buy a plant-based hamburger, right? So one hamburger could reduce your carbon footprint by, say, three kilos. Right, so that's an easy way to kind of like, you know, sustainable choice. Um, you know, having said that, it doesn't always translate this into a mass scale, but 10 years from now, that market, which today is 5 billion, will go to 85 billion US dollars um, on average. Um, so I think it, 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 it really depends on what kind of sector you're in, but definitely if you're consumer oriented, then you're gonna wanna make that investment for the long term. Um, I think the practical aspect is, is that what most people don't um, fail to take into consideration, maybe I'm speaking too much, um, single-use plastics, okay? If you think about, <laughs> you, you walk into a supermarket today and you, you know, you're forced to pay, you know, your 50th down for a plastic bag, 
how did, how did that happen to me, right? So that happened because Thailand made it an issue, right? And why did Thailand make it an issue, right? EU legislation. And why did EU legislation make it an issue? It is the supermarkets in the EU. And why did the EU supermarkets make it an issue? Is because some group of millennials saw on their Facebook or in their Instagram a picture of a turtle with a straw stuck up its nose. Said, oh, that's so terrible. And they started sharing it. And then the supermarkets, who are all buyers, all the buyers are like 27 year old millennials, right? They said, oh my God, okay, we've got to ban this stuff. So I think the acceleration of the impact that, that millennials would have from a purchasing decision perspective, maybe not power, but decision making perspective, definitely will only accelerate with the um, accelerated pace of adoption of social media. Yes, yeah, so you, you say something very interesting is that investors are ready to invest in that niches because that niches are high growth. I am in investments business and I can tell you plant based plant based companies now it's competition in all Asia to, to reach these companies to invest in. So so you know these investors know know about what is business. So it's niches with high potential. And so I, I don't know if I may add on this uh, on it's it's niche until it becomes accessible to others. And, and that I believe that that shift is going to happen and is happening as technology de develops in the world. If you look at, for instance, solar panels, uh, the price has changed dramatically in the past 20 years. The efficiency as well. So basically, the uh, payback period that you have from these products is really better than you had before. When we're going to reach that tipping point where uh, the price of these products is going to match the price uh, that uh, the middle uh, market can actually afford, I think this is not going to be a niche anymore. Like any kind of innovations that's happening, I think this will be the shift uh, for that. Uh, just, just wanted to add one, one quick thing to this. Um, uh, I think the one important thing also is that um, actually there's no trade-off in many situations anymore. Um, again, if you're a factory owner, if you have a facility in Thailand today and you don't have a solar facility on your roof, um, you're losing money every day. So, so this is not, it's not that you have to decide, I want to be sustainable or I want to make more money. It's the same thing in many, many cases. Um, and, and I think that's also the same for consumers. Oftentimes when you focus on different metrics that are sustainability related, it helps you identify inefficiencies in your processes. So anything that's related to energy efficiency, if somebody puts the focus on, okay, let's reduce our carbon footprint at this facility, what's the first thing you do? You walk through your factory and you look, oh, look, there's a hot air coming out. Oh, we pour that hot water down there. Um, I can tell you one of our clients, um, they have done an audit like that and they saved um, multi-million dollars of, of losses without any investment. So, so most of the time, there is no trade-off. It is not about I want to be sustainable or not. It's just about good business and looking broader than just the short-term profit that you're making right now. Thank you. I think we can have a, a second, a second and last question before the ending questions. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, Ingepul, I also had a comment on this. You know, I think we need to get away from thinking that sustainability comes always as the premium price. Uh, and I think this is also what uh, Florian has said. Now, uh, I think we need to talk about. Uh, you know, the, uh, the better, you know, I repeat myself, I've said it in another form actually today, we need to talk about the better user experience of more sustainable solutions, no? which are game changing and of course, and the lower cost. No? And there is no doubt that sustainability is always related to better resource efficiency because it always means less waste. No? So if like price signals are right, you know, it means ultimately that sustainability is actually the more competitive. No? And um, uh, we need to, uh, but you know, I also understand in Europe, you know, when we said we have to be climate friendly, we have to be sustainable, it was always in the head of the people to think, oh, then it must be more expensive. No? And if we want to make sustainability mainstream in Asia, we have to get that out of our head. No? But it's, it's to, I always fall in the same trap myself, and that's why I'm saying it loudly here, is to say sustainable does not mean more expensive. Sustainable must mean like better, more resource efficient, you know, more competitive. No? That's, you know, and uh, I think in Asia, you know, with again, like, like different pr uh, preferences, you know, and like this, you know, like willingness to pay more for something, you know, which is much more limited, you know, we will not succeed if we operate on the paradigm of sustainable, it means more expensive. 
Yes, its contribution. You want to put it shortly because we are running out of time. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to comment really quick. Um, I I completely agree. I think I, I've spent three three weeks on a institutional and retail roadshow for our IPO, and uh, I think one of the things that a lot of people fail to understand is, you know, our I think our our profitability margins are somewhat in line with most industries, right? But then what we do from a sustainability perspective is quite a lot. I mean, I have a dedicated team. We've got policies that we're working on, programs that we're funding across the world, across the region, and, and within Thailand itself. And yet, we're still maintaining industry peer um, margins. And so, exactly to your point, that you can be sustainable and yet be competitive. And I think that the only problem is, is that you know, the market just doesn't, they only look at that bottom line, which is unfortunate. I think, yeah, uh, oh, okay, I'm under pressure. So, uh, one last question for, okay, for thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Smith. I'd like to ask Kun Dan, I read about you say that you are like the carbon, carbon neutral CEO, right? I mean, how, 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 how can we do that? And would you set the leadership example for like internally or for the external? And how can you elaborate on like CEO as the carbon neutral person? Yeah, so I think I'm number of the 31st person to be carbon neutral certified in Thailand. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it's um, so the why first. So, so the, the why I think you know if, if if you think about you know the boardroom, you think about CEO and um, as as a leader of an organization, right? So you need to um, lead by example, and you you, you, can't, you can't you know we can't claim that we're purpose driven, purpose led without you know myself being sustainably driven, right? And um, so I, I am practically almost plant-based. Um, I am carbon neutral. Um, and so in this instance, you know, it's really important that, you know, I set that example. You know, I work seven days a week. Uh, for example, I get up at 6 a.m. Uh, so things like this, right? It's a little things that, that you know, because you can't change a culture. I, I took over a company of 1,500 people Everybody was in the old world, where it's just industrial, right? And so, and the the how is is you, you know you've just got to re-audit your footprint, um, thinking backwards. How do you reduce your carbon footprint? And then you basically then you um, you buy offsets to 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 set it off. Yo, so I think we have, we have to to go to the the closing question. Um, uh, there is a very a hand which is insisting. So, so I have a question for for one of the speaker, <laughs> not for three of them. We don't have to do, to the the time for the answer for three of them. Please ask a question. Yeah, just sir. Um, we've been talking a lot about um, the factory aspect, but from a consumer point of view, what would you recommend to us as consumers to make better, sustainable choices when we are in our daily lives or in the supermarkets? How to recognize the better products? What should we do as a consumer? I, I guess question for, for Ines, because you are the only one in B2C, actually. I'm, he loves giving I'm questions. sorry to, to give you the more difficult question, but uh, it's a question about B2C, no? No, no it's absolutely. And I think I, I can tell you uh, one of the initiatives. I don't think it's super easy today for consumers to know. Uh, even if there's a lot of digital information available. But I can tell you something that uh, L'Oreal is going to do is we're going to, in all our products, we're going to have a QR code where you will see the, um, the truth behind the product. So you will see for each of our products what is the carbon and the sustainability footprint of our products. Today, as far as I know, I don't think it's super easy uh, to understand what is, uh, you know, the difference between the products. Maybe there is, but it's true that myself as a consumer, uh, it's not super easy. But I think the brands are working in ways to make that a cr criteria of choice. Okay. Just one minute. Just one minute. Just one minute. One minute. Huh? So now I'll, I'll give you a very simple <laughs> statistic. Okay, and I, I, was, I was just speaking about this last week. So, the food industry, right, emits 40% of the carbon globally. Okay, it's worth eight trillion dollars a year. Employs 1.4 billion people. The system is designed to keep the people who work within the system poor. The entire system is designed to keep farmers poor. That's why supermarkets are always like cheaper, cheaper, cheaper but they want more sustainability. 
it doesn't work that way, right, because of inflation, right? So that's the real world. So the best way that you can, right, is to help, is that the next time you go to a supermarket and you see organic or you see, like, a little sign that says, you know, L'Oreal's only using rice bran oil, you know? It's true. <laughs> no. no, 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 no. When you see that sign, you choose with your wallet, right? That's I how you vote. These two guys will talk later. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm switching. I'm switching for sure, right? So no, no. So but, but but really, that's the simple choice, right? So you look at exactly what she said. Is that you know who's behind that product? Okay. So so now we are, don't have any more questions. We we are, we are Amel and I have a last question to to ask the three panelists with, with a short answer. Which market trends? do you see in your business, in your sector, will disrupt your business in the following 10 years? Let's look at the future. After COVID, you know, you know, let's at the future. And it will make a difference in your industry for, for, the, for the coming, coming years. So we want to start. I will not ask Ines, because I'm always asking Ines question, difficult questions, but we want to start. We will we disrupt your, your, your business in the fall, not next year, huh? it's too easy, in the following 10 years. You're ready, I'm sure. <laughs> um, well, I mean, for, for the power infrastructure, I think the, the biggest challenge still today, although there are many, uh, many advances being made, is, is storage. So energy storage is really what, uh, um, where the frontier is today. There's many prog a lot of progress being made. Um, cost curves look very similar to solar a few years ago. Uh, so I think we're all very, very positively um, inclined to, to see that making a big change. And that's really the last piece um, for renewable energy to be competitive uh, with, uh, with traditional fossil fuel-based systems. Um, and uh, and there I want to highlight, it's not only lithium-ion batteries that everybody talks about, but there, there are other storage options. Hydrogen is getting a lot of attention in, in Europe at the moment um, for, for long-term storage. So, so those are things that, at least for us, we're, we're watching very closely um, in, in order to, uh, to make sure that that can be deployed and, and we're ready to deploy that to our clients as well in order to, to cover that last bit of um, emissions. So uh, it, from, a, from a food perspective, I can't talk for any other industry, but from, from, from a food perspective, I, I think most people may think that climate change um, is maybe it's wishy-washy, maybe it's about our numbers. Um, but I would say this, in, in the next 10 years, I think climate change, and specifically carbon, will probably be the single largest um, disruptor from labeling, tariffs, right, consumer demand, um, and then, you know, whether you realize it or not, I think it's going to happen. Acceleration of digital literacy and social media will make it happen than EU legislation. So I think, you know, hats off to, I think, the European Union. Big fan. Um, you're driving, you know, change globally. Um, yeah. And I would say two big things, digital and uh, trust. Why do I say that? Digital, I think we're just seeing the beginning. Digital will keep disrupting itself uh, and it will disrupt supply chains for better so not for worse for better um, and then the beauty industry is going to be a massive uh, opportunity in terms of sustainability because it will allow us to reach much more consumers in a much more uh, efficient way so that's one the second one is trust and i think it relates a lot with the topic of today um, it's difficult to think why does tr why will trust be a disruptor, but uh, if the people go to the bottom of the things, if people really start asking the good questions, if people really start demanding what is behind the influencers, what is behind the spokespeople, what is behind the brands, I think a lot of brands will disappear. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Or do we have time? And this was the last question? It was the last question. It was the last question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the answer was kind of a last question as well. <laughs> yes. Is that? It is the last question. All right, great. So <laughs> please give them a big round of applause <laughs> for a great moderation by Henri and Amel, and also uh, great uh, thought provoking uh, ideas and. Uh, messages that we heard from our panelists. Also give them a big round of applause. Uh, Ines, uh, Florian, and Kudan. Thank you so much.
and I'm sure we can carry the conversation to the, uh, the cocktails. It's always a challenge to uh, hold the, uh, the last session of the day when people are already, you know, dying for some drinks. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, you've been a wonderful audience as well. So that's why we want to uh, treat you as well with some uh, food for the future. But I'm not sure if you can actually eat it. <laughs> it's eat the grease. So uh, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Kun Sean uh, too uh, to uh, draw some name cards. We have uh, prizes for two lucky winner. If you haven't learned about uh, eat uh, the grease, they're outside, and uh, Kun Sean will tell you more about it. Or perhaps you can tell me a little bit here. Uh, what is this? Um, okay. Basically, this, these packs are for you to solve your drainage problem. If your house or office has clocking issue or small problem, you can try to use it. If you don't know how to use it, please give me a call. My contact number is there. I will teach you what to do. All right. Okay. okay. So we have our first. Uh, Dr. Pet Manopalit. I saw him a while ago. Dr. Pet, you know? Okay. And the other one? Okay, uh, Elena Sergiva or Sergiva? Elena? Yes. These are the two winners. Uh, okay, over there, please. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you say something in closing in a, mi yeah. in a minute. Yes. And uh, a quick reminder, if you uh, get into the building and you have the, uh, the parking ticket, which looks like this, make sure you validate your parking uh, outside at the registration table before you leave uh, the building. And uh, well, I will give a, a microphone to Henri to uh, close the session for this SBF 20. Or yeah. Amel, yeah, both I, of you. I, 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 we all want to make a, a long speech, but uh Really, sincerely, it is just to, to share our thanks because all the speakers were just amazing today. Uh, and I also want to share to thanks very much all the team. We are not and I passionate about that for, for many years, but uh, we, we gather and uh, we gather many partners. I want to list them on sponsors uh, and uh, an organizing team. Uh, we work very nicely together all over the past two months. So I want really sincerely thank them very much for all the work they did. And I think the result deserve their efforts. So I think I may will say something more about next year. Because oh. it's a yearly event. So every year we're gathering. So that lets you <laughs> you're make your own conclusion. You're giving me the difficult conclusion part. We haven't spoken about it yet. I wanted to thank uh, you all also for attending um, because uh, well, with this COVID situation, we didn't really know what to expect. Uh, and it's been a very great attendance, uh, a very great participation also in all the talks, of course, the speakers as well and our partners. Next year, uh, don't know when yet, uh, but we'll have, of course, uh, the fifth uh, edition of the Sustainability for Business Forum, and we'll also choose topics uh, that relate to uh, all the different trends and things happening in the area here in Thailand. And I hope you'll all be uh, joining us again. Um, but I think uh, the most important thing is uh, now I will all invite you to go to uh, have a drink mm -hmm. uh, in the networking cocktail. I know that you've been uh, wanting to do that, and I hope we get an occasion to chat if we haven't uh, yet before. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the organizer of this event, I'm Varun Sachideo signing off, and that's a wrap. You've been a wonderful audience. Have a great evening. So I'll be clapped.